two minutes. Stick around. We'll be back. Hello, everybody. It's about to... I think we're a few minutes before the um, stream or the trading day starts. I'm off to a slow start this morning. My baby girl called me Little Magic. And of course, everything stops if Little Magic calls. So let me take care of some housekeeping things. Good morning and welcome to the channel. My name is Sandra and you have discovered my channel from Lack to Legacy. On this channel, we're all things money, investing and mindset particularly how to go from a scarcity mindset to a mindset of abundance. If this sounds like something that you're interested in, please stay. Let me help you. What you've um, stumbled upon is a learning community. I started trading, started, I took a class about five or six months ago and I was studying by myself and it didn't feel good. So I opened up my home to other people who were interested in learning to trade. And so we gather here um, two days a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays, from opening bell to noon, and we just talk trading stuff. I share things, people share, people drop by and leave us comments. Good morning, Nyrell. Happy Tuesday. I'm off to a bit of a, not even a rocky start, you guys, just an unconventional start. I got up, I took some pictures this morning, I talked with my daughter. If my kids call, everything stops. If my kids call, if my grandkids call, I don't care what the market is doing because I don't get a chance to see them regularly. So forgive me. My, um, I still got to make my coffee. <laughs> still got to find my glasses and all of that stuff. But I'm hoping today we can do some paper trading. So I'm going to turn on the news so we can just kind of see. I can tell you this. Chairman Powell, um, he is the Fed chair. He has some announcements to make today. And usually on the days that he makes announcements, the market, you'll see some fluctuation in the market. So let me just switch over so you guys can see what I'm looking at. I am looking at QQQ, of course. And I think we have, what time is it? Wait a minute. Does that say? I don't know. What do I know? I'm looking at this thing. Let's see. How much time do we have before the day starts? Uh, maybe we got a half an hour. I don't know, but it's a little bit of time before, or maybe it's an hour, 7.30, 8.30. Oh, we do. We have a whole hour before the day starts. Thank goodness, because I thought I was late, Nyrell. <laughs> I'm actually early. Well, I tell you what, it's better to be early than to be late. So what I'm going to do is just leave the news and stuff up. We got an hour before the bell rings, the uh, morning bell. So I'll be checking back in. I got to go make my coffee. Got to go find my glasses and get set up for the day. So we have one hour. We're counting down to the opening bell. The opening bell is at 830. So I will meet you guys back here in a little bit. So in the meantime, oh, I'll also pop up some candlesticks too, so that you can see the candlestick Bible. I wish you guys could flip through it yourself. But if you have access to the Google Drive, you can go there. Another thing that I would suggest you do, I have a new boo. Everybody knows I made an announcement. His name is Oliver Velez. And I'm talking about, I learned so much from him. So do yourself a favor. Go find Oliver Velez. I posted on the, um, I put it on the community tab, but he is awesome. He teaches the way I learn. It is, he doesn't overcomplicate it. I'm, I'm just in love, y'all. Yeah, yeah, that's my new boy. You know, Rainer Teo was my first bow, my first trading bow. But Oliver Velez is like next level. So while I go make coffee, please go check out the community tab and check out Oliver Velez. All right, now I'm real. I'll catch you in a little bit. I know what to do. There we go. You will still get the volume. So let's get some sound going here. 
why I think the talk is continuing to be very high. And I'm going to change this chart. The market is now pricing at a much higher probability that rates are going to remain higher for longer. The one caveat, to though, the, the one interesting thing minute. I want to point out here, Ben, is you know the way that the market's handled this most mm -hmm. recent reset mm -hmm. and expectations is pretty impressive Absolutely. by and large. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, I think that when you look at the scenarios last year compared to this year, really a much different storyline. Oh, and that's why we continue to have this de debate okay. uh, regarding the landing and what the landing actually looks like. Because, you know, to some degree, I'll the market's you guys in a, uh, dealing in a minute. with much higher interest rates and the expectation that rates are going to remain higher for longer and holding up here in the middle of this range that has developed and looking uh, like it wants to try to gain some more or further momentum once we do see some moderation and a little bit maybe clearer uh, understanding of where rates are going to ultimately settle out. You know, I, to Dan's point here, I've been looking at this, and I think you uh, bring up uh, something that's very interesting here as far as the market, how it has fared well, considering the runoff that we saw in rates recently. This is a look at the TNX again. We pulled this chart multiple times here today, but I want to point to the fact that Back to 10, 4% here, we're essentially back to where we were the first week of November. And as you look at the S&Ps, first week in November, I mean, we'd be, where is it? It's down around 3,700, 3,750. Right. So we're 300 points above that still. So I think the market has fared considerably well. Will that all come to an abrupt end today, uh, though, is the question with the <laughs> Fed Chair Jerome Powell, right? He has another opportunity to take on a very hawkish tone after he's missed or passed on multiple chances to do so. After stronger than expected data, we heard from after the non-farm payrolls, it didn't really tip the scales one way or the other. But now with the core numbers, with the core PCE, the CPI, the unit labor costs, I mean, we were talking at the top of the show, one data point does not a trend make, but we've seen uh, quite the trend play out here over the last month or so now. Yeah, uh, shifting of the trends, Ben, the short-term trends, where we did see some relief late last year into January and the market really responded positively mm -hmm. to that. And now we're seeing uh, some hesitation, and and rightly so. It's yeah. I think the the bottom line is it's not going to be an even situation. Uh, I think uh, it's interesting that uh, Reserve Bank of Australia, mm -hmm. you know, basically indicated that they feel rates have peaked or inflation has peaked, and uh, so their uh, guidance moving forward has been viewed today as much less hawkish, and uh, and so that. You know, that sometimes those central banks are canaries in the coal mine, you know, to use that analogy. And so that, at least for the short term, may be alleviated. Okay, you guys, the market opens pressure. in about an hour. Uh, so I'm making my coffee and here, all that other good stuff. Uh, maintaining an elevated stance. I'll be back at market open. To the service sector. I thought and I was we late. See wage inflation, which does not necessarily directly translate into uh, inflation on the top end. It still is a component that has to be considered, and we do see labor markets being very tight, and the expectation are that wages are going to continue to be uh, elevated, which uh, will work its way through the supply chain and through the pricing structure, uh, I, and I think that that's a concern for the Fed, and we'll see how he handles that today, because you're right, Ben. Um, you know, we're getting we got a mixed message last week from some of the Fed officials mm -hmm. as well. Not a mixed message, but at least a softening maybe of the, the tone a bit. And the markets responded very positively to that. OK, Dan, you probably know where I'm headed next. I'm wondering what all this means for the U.S. dollar. <laughs> and we're going to break down the currencies in just a second. Some of the central bank activity you mentioned, the RBA, Bank of Canada tomorrow. Mexican peso has been on fire. Uh, uh, the Australian dollar into New Year low prints. I mean, so yep. a lot of focus on the currencies. We're going to dive into that in a second. But you've got the greenback, which is hovering right around 104, 105. We were talking about the indices faring pretty well amidst rates to the upside, but the dollar's really yet to participate. Yeah, it has. It is uh, kind of, yeah, it has not, uh, well, it, it, it's trended higher though, Ben. I mean, you're right. It hasn't necessarily participated to the effect that uh, when we did see rates push up here, particularly the short end of the curve, mm -hmm. maintaining these elevated levels. So yeah, there is a bit of moderation there. Uh, and I think that that's because of uh, some of the dynamics from a global perspective. But we do have uh, central bank activity today, tomorrow, uh, and then uh, and then we'll continue to see that unfold over the coming weeks. 
And the dollar is uh, pushing back up just shy of the where it started the year, you know, below where well below the highs of last year. Yeah. But the trend has, at least for the short term, uh, shown uh, some, you know, reversal of sorts. And uh, and then it's, it's a key level here, Ben, you know, 105, I think, you know, if we were to break above there, then, you know, then that would definitely be a short term reversal that could gain further strength. And that would be a challenge for the equity markets. That would be yeah. a challenge from yeah. a global perspective. So that's something to definitely keep an eye on. Okay, this is the lid that we've seen recently around this 105 level. But let's just pull that chart for one more second because I want to point to we were talking about 10-year yields to that uh, uh, November level, 4%, and how the indices are holding above, what, 3,700 is the November level for the S&Ps. Look at the November level for the dollar. You're talking about 110, 111. Yeah. I mean, so, uh, again, what a divergence here from rates and some of these other markets that we watch very closely. Dan, appreciate you sharing part of your Tuesday with us and filling in this morning. Dan Deming, the managing director at KKM Financial. Now for a check on a couple developing stories. It's time to bring in Jenny Horn, markets correspondent here on the TD Ameritrade Network. Jenny, you got your eye on a couple companies reporting quarterly results. Well, one that we've seen results from, one we're going to get ahead of. Talk to me about what's going on with Dick's Sporting Goods. What's the latest there? Yeah, Ben, Dick's Sporting Goods really showing us the resiliency we're seeing from these apparel or sports enthused, you know, retailers because that has been a consistent theme with names like Nike, Lululemon also remaining at least more solid than some of their peers. Dick's Sporting Goods today showing their no exception now up over 110% off their yearly low after reporting a better than expected profit outlook for the year as they do explain plan to expand their stores and increase their merchandise margin. They said they expect their 2023 fiscal year earnings to fall between 1290 and 1380 per share, which is higher than the $12 per share consensus analysts had been expecting. And as you can see there, they did beat on both top and bottom line with their adjusted earnings coming in around 293 per share, just slightly ahead of forecast, although lower from year ago levels. Their gross profit margin contracted about 516 basis points year over year to 32 percent operating margin also did contract about 554 basis points and operating income for the quarter fell just over 34 percent to 311 million now the ceos of the company will grow its sales and earnings in 2023 partially through a return to square footage growth and a higher merchandise margin now this stock did move up i saw as much as six percent in reaction to this report but i think all in all the fact that you have you know, the plans to expand, plans to increase the size of your store when every other retailer is doing the exact opposite, and to the fact that you have strong guidance. And they did also give a, issue a quarterly dividend of about $1 per share payable at the end of March, which is 105% an increase over the company's quarterly dividend that they saw a year ago, Ben. So signs of a very healthy company. And I think this world in which they operate is showing that retail has areas of strength still. It's just been very difficult to pinpoint them. Let's uh, take a quick look here in terms of the chart. Jenny mentioned the spike up to 142, still holding that upper level around 139, 140. As we head into the cash open, I want to point to the bigger picture look and how Dix has fared pretty well, right? You can see they're hanging out near the highs up around this 138 level and uh, basically waiting, or the bulls are, I should say, for a breakout here, continuation of the pattern. We've seen the trend of the upside from 63. They've doubled plus some here. Let's get into crowd strike today after the bell. Denny, what, Jenny, what should we be looking for? So, okay, Ben, I would have thought that I had this report all pinned down because what we've seen in the, the area in which that CrowdStrike operates is this cybersecurity cloud area, which Okta, I mean, other names like Palo Alto Networks have had really strong results. And then Zscaler threw us through a complete loop on Friday, tanking 10% after their quarterly results. So now I'm, I'm a little bit concerned ahead of CrowdStrike's results because I would have said that this area of cloud has been doing fairly well. That's not the case. So the street is expecting adjusted earnings of 43 cents per share on revenue of about 624 million. Now, this figure on its bottom line would be an increase on a year over year basis. Revenue would also mark a pretty sizable increase. And we also have seen really consistent improvements in their top line as on average, it has grown about 40% on a year over year basis, which is pretty strong. They've also beaten 
analyst estimates in the trailing four quarters by an average surprise of about 35 percent. So their history of beating earnings is looking pretty promising. Now, their fourth quarter results, the street is expecting to have benefited from the continued solid demand for their products, given this healthy environment for cybersecurity products. The increasing number of people that have been logging into their networks have triggered that a greater need for security and might have spurred demand in their product growth in the fourth quarter. At least that's what the analyst community is thinking. Now, we have seen pretty stellar revenue growth from this company consistently in con subscriptions, which has con consistently again contributed to pretty strong top line results, like I have said. But we've also can naturally see that this company is facing pretty stiff competition, competition, but they are collaborating with AWS. So that's seen as a positive. But like I said, Ben, it feels like it's anyone's game here because I was looking at these names, looking at this space, thinking we've seen consistent beats and then Zscaler was the outlier. So we'll have to see what bucket they fall into if they're able to please what is becoming a very difficult to please street. You know, as I look at the stock, I think a reflection of what you uh, are down uh, uh, at 92 we were trading back in the beginning of the year all the way up to 135 and it is a reflection of a history for beating in earnings a healthy environment as Jenny mentioned for cybersecurity products and just to take a quick look in terms of where things stand as far as CrowdStrike relative to the 50 day they're above the 50 day the shorter day moving average but still holding below the 200 so again here's that move we just looked at you can see they're trying to recover after a longer term trend to the downside from 242 to that 92 low to begin the year. Jenny Horn, appreciate you joining us. Solid breakdown. I'll look at a couple names, companies making headlines this morning, focus on quarterly results in terms of, uh, well, CrowdStrike to come and Dick's Sporting Goods uh, already out. We're going to take a quick break, stay where you are, and we come back. Michael Zarensky joins us to deep dive into some of the central bank activity as we gear up for the Fed meeting, the RBA going ahead and raising rates. And chart master Rick Ducat's got his eye on the U.S. dollar. And simply put, stay where you are, you're positioned properly. You're watching the TD Ameritrade Network, and there's lots more futures to come after this. <laughs> We empower those who act. Those who see the correlation between upswings and downswings. Those who manage risk by meeting each obstacle with a perfectly executed strategy, a measured approach, the right tools, driving accuracy. CME Group, where risk meets opportunity. Whether you're an experienced investor or just getting started, TD Ameritrade offers a webcast that's right for you. The platform demo webcast series is designed to help you broaden your knowledge of tools and resources available from TD Ameritrade. You'll learn tips and tricks to help navigate tdameritrade.com, thinkorswim, and mobile-based platforms. Most of all, you can ask questions by chatting directly with an education coach. It's interactive learning at its finest. Tune in live or watch on demand. Head over to tdameritrade.com slash webcast and start learning today. The Ameritrade Network has arrived on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange new location with access to the biggest newsmakers in Wall Street, bringing you in-depth market coverage and real-time trade ideas. Do not miss our exclusive interviews with CEOs, bell ringers, traders, and stock pickers, keeping you informed as you navigate your investments. Don't miss Trading 360 at 11 a.m. Eastern and the watch list at 2 p.m. Eastern, live from the New York Stock Exchange, only on the TV Ameritrade Network. Welcome back to the Future Show here on the TD Ameritrade Network. The focus this morning, we've been talking about a couple stocks making headlines. Fed Chair Jerome Powell's testimony later this morning on Capitol Hill. He'd be addressing the 
uh, Senate Banking uh, Committee ultimately. And well, Mike Sremsey is joining us this morning, Director of Futures at Charles Schwab, because Michael, good morning to you. It's not just Fed Chair Jerome Powell this morning. We heard from the RBA, Reserve Bank of Australia, and they raised rates by 25 basis points. A new low for the year for the Australian dollar as it seems like they weren't willing to commit to further hikes to come. Good morning, Ben. Absolutely right there. Uh, the uh, 25 basis point uh, increase by the uh, Reserve Bank of Australia was really back into the market that took their benchmark rate to 3.6%, which is the highest since June of uh, 2012, Ben. But it was really the uh, comments there from... Uh, RBA Governor Philip Lowther that really, I think, kind of took the uh, winds out of the uh, Aussie sale, which has already been in a downtrend here since the uh, February 2nd high. Uh, a couple of things is one, uh, in the statement, though, that they did note, though, that further monetary tightening would be needed to get inflation back to their targeted rate. They didn't say uh, increase in interest rate. They said monetary tightening. So what's being factored in here, I think, is that the bank may have maybe one, possibly two more interest rate hikes in its playbook here, but then they're going to be on a pause as well as uh, uh, Governor Lowe was uh, also quick to say, though, that he believes that inflation has peaked, according to the CPI in Australia there. And he said that the path for a uh, soft landing for the Australian economy was very narrow there. And that the possibility of the economy falling into recession in the next 24 months uh, is quite possible there as well, too. So I, I think it's really those factors there where it's not necessarily that it was another rate hike and that, you know, they need to do further tightening. It's that the, the tightening cycle is nearing an end. And that's why we're seeing the weakness here in the Australian dollar here at its lowest levels here since the late December. Uh, RBA saying that in assessing when and how much further interest rate interest rates need to increase, the board will be paying close attention to developments in the global economy. So trends in household spending, they said, and the outlook for inflation and labor conditions. So obviously some of the focal points we have here in the U.S. that are shared as well. Uh, let's talk about how, you know, as I look at this, this was a record 10th consecutive hike. So again, it really speaks to the uh, severity in terms of what central bankers are dealing with in terms of these uh, stubbornly high inflationary pressures. Let's talk about uh, how we should be keeping an eye out for the Bank of Canada up next. Absolutely right. Yeah, Bank of Canada has their interest rate announcement tomorrow okay. afternoon. And a little bit different situation here because the Bank of Canada uh, announced after their January meeting there that they're going to probably take a pause in rate hikes. So we're not expecting any change and their uh, key benchmark rate is supposed to stay at 4.5%. Now, there's a couple of things with the, the Canada here is uh, one, kind of like with the U.S. here, they're also seeing uh, really a very strong labor market. In fact, their last uh, labor data there showed 150,000 jobs created there when the market was expecting maybe 15,000. So it's a huge beat there on labor. However, some of the other economic conditions are starting to slow. One of them, their uh, fourth quarter GDP was unchanged. That was uh, in an increase of about 1.15%. And also the latest, the IV PMI readings, they're really sharply lower than expectations, 51.6. The market was looking for 57.7. So you're starting to see that little bit of a slowdown there in the uh, Canadian economy. Plus uh, oil prices we know are uh, well below their recent highs as well too, but still, it's still elevated as well too. So you're seeing maybe a little bit of a a little bit of a, a headwind there from the energy price, higher energy prices, which would be a little bit supportive for the loony. So kind of similar to what we're seeing in the Australian dollar, we're seeing a, a downtrend here in the Canadian dollar since that peak, once again, that, that date, that February 2nd date, which also corresponds to the lowest rates we've seen the 10-year note recently as well, too. So it's, interest rates really matter to these currency markets. So for the Canadian dollar here, I think we're going to listen to the comments there from uh, – BOC Governor Tiff uh, Macklin there and see what if he's going to continue there with that policy there of keeping the uh, Bank of Canada on pause there. And right now, the, uh, a lot of the bank analysts think that we may not see any additional rate hikes here from the BOC the rest of the year. Our neighbors to the north, Mike, last raised rates on January 4th. I see up 25 basis points and they currently stand at four and a half percent. Definitely something to Keep an eye on here as we gear up for the Fed. Uh, again, it's not just Fed Chair Jerome Powell on Capitol Hill today. There's multiple focal points when you're talking about currencies, central bank activity, and forgot to mention here the Mexican peso, which has been just unfair to the upside. Not necessarily a consideration when you're talking about the dollar index, but these other decisions from global central bankers are. Michael Zarensky, thanks for joining us this Tuesday morning to help us talk 
cryptocurrency markets and to further that discussion to shift the fundamentals to the technicals. I've got Rick Decat joining us this morning. He's the chart master and he's got his eye on the U.S. dollar. Rick, good morning to you. We were talking earlier in the show about how we've seen the pound recover off the lows from last year, the uh, euro currency, uh, some of the central bank activity that we have are uh, looking forward to and uh, anticipation of. Talk to us about what's going on in the U.S. dollar. Uh, it's, it seems to be a reflection of what we've seen in some of these other markets. It's in a bit of a uh, tight, narrow range and a bit of a holding pattern and simply put, waiting for more information. Exactly. The greenback's taking a bit of a breather would be my one sentence summary of this. Okay. We had an uptrend here. As you can see, this blue dashed line, we're up about 3.6% from those lows where the uptrend began, down now about 0.8% from the highs up okay. here. And as you said, Ben, kind of a symmetrical triangle type pattern, two trend lines converging toward each other, going across the highs and the lows, looking for a breakout really in either direction as the pattern compresses and the price action tightens even further. Uh, this is kind of a an interesting situation for traders. It gives you some opportunities to, to look for that big move potentially either to the upside or the downside. Dollar index recovering off the lows that we saw again around that 101 level. And as I look at this, a couple areas of consolidation as you sort of look, you get this sideways area around 101.50, 60 area. You get a high conviction breakout to the upside, a little bit more consolidation. Again, another big move up. I'd argue that we could even pull back to the 103.60 level before, again, you really take out anything significant highs from uh, uh, last month around that. Again, we'll call it 103.40, 103.50 area. But let's take a step back. I want to see where things stand in terms of the bigger picture because the dollar at this level right now, I mean, here it is really, for the most part, in the middle of the range that we established throughout last year. Year. We had a low last year, 94, up to 114, and here we are smack dab in the middle at this 104.50 area. Yeah, a bit of a different picture when you zoom out here. We had this long decline mm -hmm. here in this downward mm -hmm. channel here. Then we had this uptrend that was broken to, and you know, trending just sideways since then here. We're down about 9% off those yearly highs, and uh, our moving averages that we follow, yellow 21 day, orange 63 day, purple, yes, purple I mean, 252 day, trending sideways, yeah, really. Yeah. And uh, there's a very important confluence right here. All those moving averages are converging right on top of each other, and they also happen to be overlapping with the volume profile point of control. So right around the 104 level is a critical point for this product here. That could be a pivot point toward further downside or an important support point. And, you know, I know that sounds kind of obvious. It's either going to go up or down. But what we, what we try to identify with technical analysis is these points where it could be the most advantageous to try to put a trade on. And this is one of those points right here where we have all these indicators converging at the same point. We'll see if Fed Chair Jerome Powell today brings the paddles and zaps this one, brings this one back to life here. Talk to us what's going on in terms of the RSI, not really providing a lean one way or the other in the middle of this range. Yeah, exactly. Kind of just following the price action, still tilted toward the bullish side, but really uh, the, the two areas that I had my eye on here, 105.57 to the upside, this okay. red dashed line represents the highs from here and like here, it. and that would be the point where we need to bust above to get some more upside price action here and then you had mentioned kind of the top of this range earlier mm -hmm. 10360 mm -hmm. i believe that looked like a good point to watch too but 10285 was the bottom of the range here and that would be the door to further downside i think if we were to break through that level tightly knit price activity i've been describing crude as a drift. I've been talking about the indices in a range. I mean, I think that's a pretty good way to describe what we're seeing here in terms of the U.S. dollar as well. We'll see if we can stir things up a little bit with Fed Chair Jerome Powell. Some of the data due out headed our way. And well, Rick Decat taking a look at technicals in the dollar index. And well, that's it for us here at Futures for today. Thanks for joining us. And well, stick around because there's still lots to come here across the TD Ameritrade network throughout the day. Headed your way next Morning Trade Live. Oliver Rick. Opportunities can be hard to find, like catching lightning in a bottle. In uncertain times, it's tempting to retreat or simply wait and see. At CME Group, we empower those who act. We deliver tools to help manage risk and capture opportunities in every market climate across every major asset class to seize each possibility at precisely the right moment. CME Group, opportunity is everywhere.
Many option traders tend to focus on price and direction, but implied volatility can also be a big factor in options trades. In the Options for Volatility course, we explore what implied volatility is, how it could potentially affect the price of an option. For example, let's say an option trader wants to take a bearish position on a stock, but isn't sure whether to buy a put or sell a call. Both strategies are bearish, but looking beyond direction to consider the impact of applied volatility could help the trader choose between them. We also introduce strategies designed to harness changes in implied volatility. For instance, time spreads like counters and diagonals are designed to benefit from increases in implied volatility. Iron condors, on the other hand, are designed to benefit from falling implied volatility. After learning about the strategies, you can take the final assessment to test your knowledge. Head to the education tab on Thinkorswim for the full options for volatility course and a whole lot more. TD Ameritrade Network has arrived on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange new location with access to the biggest newsmakers in Wall Street, bringing you in-depth market coverage and real-time trade ideas. Do not miss our exclusive interviews with CEOs, bell ringers, traders, and stock pickers, keeping you informed as you navigate your investments. Don't miss Trading 360 at 11 a.m. Eastern and the watch list at 2 p.m. Eastern, live from the New York Stock Exchange, only on the TD Ameritrade Network. Many traders may be willing to take on additional risk in pursuit of aggressive growth in their portfolio. More power to them. But if you're looking for a less risky alternative, you might want to consider checking out our income investing course. In the income investing course, you'll explore investing strategies designed to generate regular income and preserve capital. First, we'll delve into risk and return preferences. You will learn about the different ways to allocate a portfolio and create a payment schedule. Then we'll take a deep dive into the assets commonly held in income portfolios, dividend stocks, bonds, equity REITs, and cash. You'll also learn about routines for managing a portfolio over time. Along the way, you'll watch videos, take quizzes, and perform paper trades to practice your new skills. So if you're looking for an edge, consider your education. Head to the education tab on Thinkorswim for the income investing course and a whole lot more. starting to kind of feel like spring after showers that came 50 degrees. Markets are going to get a little taste here of where we are in the season for Jerome Powell. Is it like Jackson Hole where he's hawkish or is it like last month where he was dovish? We're going to hear from the Fed chair over the next two days and markets got a little cold feet yesterday after a real strong start faded throughout the session, ended down pretty hard in the small caps. We've had a pretty big gap between the Russell and the NASDAQ as we see the tech trade trying to catch some of that breakaway velocity, but just not quite getting there. Started off with a real strong day in Apple after an upgrade from the team at Goldman, but there's still some catches here in the overall mega cap trade as we see with Meta announcing more cuts today. We're gonna to talk about that. Pretty big layoffs happening. And so far the market has liked that, but will there be an extent to which it doesn't if it does signal overall strain in some of these important businesses? We do have some earnings. We're gonna dive into Dick Sporting Goods, trading near the highs. One of the consumer stocks is still riding some of the COVID wave as the pickup of sports and outdoor activity has been a great trade for that stock. We'll talk about it in some detail here today. We're also gonna talk about the airlines with the JetBlue deal, a lot going on there. So we're gonna have a good show coming up and uh, we don't have to wait too long for Powell because 10 a.m. Eastern time means so we'll start getting some early tone from him at 9 a.m. in about one hour here. So gonna be a busy morning. 
let's check out the charts and see where we're at right now. S&P 500 appropriately is basically back to where it was when Powell started off last month with a bang. That was here. That's the big jump up. February 1st and 2nd, Jerome Powell sounding dovish. Pop, pop, pop. S&P loved it, but then we couldn't hold it. Lower highs, lower highs, big drop off, a little bit of consolidation, but still making lower lows here. So we're kind of establishing a short term downtrend and bam, we close out last week with a lot of strength, try to follow it through. And now we are back here at 4060. You can take a straight line and take it back to where this is. This is crazy the way markets work. It's kind of beautiful though, pretty appropriate. So the narrative here is pretty simple. Powell sounded dovish at the beginning of the month last month. It couldn't hold because the data was too strong, especially in terms of inflation, but also the labor market too, and employment just overall surprisingly positive. So as we start thinking about inflation and a more aggressive path for the Fed, stock market fades down, the Powell pop, gets a little intense with some of the selling, comes back, puts us right to where we were, and now we can pretty much understand what this market deems is most important. It is Jerome Powell, because when we've taken this full 180 and then another one back here, and we end up at the same spot, that's pretty amazing stuff. Now, generally, I do believe that old support and new resistance is a pretty good technical baseline to operate from when we're thinking about charts. And it did look like somewhere here, 4060-ish, 4050 was some kind of support. We bounced there. We got a little bit of trade before it broke down. The fact that we broke down pretty hard back to below 4,000 after we got through this level to the downside, you can almost kind of imagine a little bit of a line right here that comes across and that's where we're at. So if that old support now acts as resistance, then that's gonna be trouble for stocks. Basically what I'm saying is if we don't rally on Powell, then it probably means we come back down pretty hard and we start making new lows in this 30 day chart because the trend last month had been lower highs and lower lows. So that's the short term trend here. Thinking about what could be the wild card in this conversation, Look, there's other potential headlines. The U.S. and China seem to be getting a little bit more tense here, especially as we're talking about banning TikTok. Overall, though, VIX and volatility is pretty low, but a similar situation here, if you take stocks, flip it on their head, kind of looks like the VIX right now, back down to below 19, is also kind of looking like we're at a floor. So it does seem like the path of least resistance for volatility as measured by the VIX is probably upwards here. So that kind of fits with the negative stock perspective of potential resistance in the equity market, potential support in the VIX. Dollar and rates, uh, those what are what we need to watch here to understand if the market is repricing expectations of a hawkish path from Powell. Bonds in the dollar in terms of the 10 year yield, the greenback also just linked together again. We're seeing them come back together as they were throughout much of the last year and a half. And when they do that, link to the upside and move together, that's when financial tightening is happening. When Powell spoke last month, at the beginning of February, financial conditions in the economy were the loosest in a year. And now as the market has repriced over the past month with the dollar moving higher and interest rates moving higher on the yield, that means we've got some more tightening, which means Powell probably is likely to follow that and give us something a little bit more hawkish, at least compared to what we heard in February. If it's enough to keep the tenure and the dollar moving higher, that's probably your easy call to understand if stocks are going to go lower again. I got Kevin Hanks here with me in the studio, host of Fast Market. What do you think, Kevin? Is that it's pretty, pretty much gonna a situation? Be a fun day. Yeah, I think the dollar and rates are a key thing you have to watch. But if you can pick one, pick rates. Yeah. Right? I think the dollar, that relationships get a little dicey because yeah. of foreign governments having to be more hawkish. But rates, rates were the story yesterday, Oliver. Remember, they started down and finished up and the and the and the market kind of lost its bid when rates uh stopped going down and finished up on the day so but still both very important to where this market's going but most important to where this market's going today jerome powell yeah. and his testimony in front of the senate starts about nine o'clock chicago time 
10 o'clock Eastern, and he's going to have to address payrolls the last month, CPI, PPI, PCE, all unit labor cost. He's going to have to talk about all of it <laughs> wow. today. And some of the numbers are going back up and reigniting on the upside. And what's he going to say? We should know the tone pretty quick to what, what, what he's going to come out. Because remember, in Jackson Hole, that one-off event that, that he did, that eight-minute famous speech in Jackson Hole, he got to the news pretty quick mm -hmm. that he was being harsh. So we'll see what happens today. Question and answer, always very revealing. But, Oliver, then we get to the data. You know, think about it. Last month, ADP and payrolls. 106,000 in ADP, 517 in payrolls. Someone introduced these two groups. Jolts, a month ago, over 11 million. They're expecting 10.6. Okay. I don't know where the drop-off's coming from based on the short-term data that, that we get, but they think that that is going to drop to 10.6 million. There we go. Then we get payrolls on Friday after we get another jobless claims number. We get payrolls. The expectations from 517 to 215, uh, unemployment 3.4, the same. Wages up 0.3, oh. the same. Year over year, it was 4.4. Let's see what that comes in. But this market is going to set expectations based on consensus, based on what Jerome Powell says. I still think, at least for Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, it's Jerome Powell speaking today. There's some argument to be made that um, maybe he won't use this as the venue to make a big policy speech, but he's going to get grilled on the stuff that ins that's important. And with employment situation on Friday right behind him, it seems like the – kind of game theory from his perspective would be that there's just too much at risk if um, he wants to be taken seriously to sound dovish and then we right. get another big employment report like the last one because that last report was so eye-popping right and it was right after he spoke that's where the volatility has come from because it just seemed like he was totally off in his tone right. at the beginning of february based on the data that followed and with this data scheduled for friday you think he might want to hedge his bets a little bit he's got to come in i would think at least a little more hawkish than he's been in the past yeah. remember you got the March 21st, 22nd is the next Fed meeting. Before that, you get CPI on the 14th, PPI on the 15th, retail sales on the 15th. You do get more numbers. You get the jobs data on Friday. It's pretty tight. And, you know, that week later jobs number clumps that data in, into a little tighter space. So we're going to get a, a lot of data in the next, oh, 10 to 15 days. Okay. It's going to get fun here. All right. Uh, good stuff. Pretty rough uh, fade yesterday, especially yeah. for the small caps. Yeah, it was just a market blasted. that lost its inertia when when yields went from down to up on the day. Okay, appreciate it, Kev. Yeah. Thanks for the heads up. Let's talk some company news. Let's talk about those metal layoffs. Pretty big story here this morning, competing for uh, the news headlines with Jerome Powell. Uh -huh. These are pretty big, uh, we need to take us through. They're really big, and I don't want to underestimate the fact that Bloomberg is reporting that morale is really low at Meta, mm. and many employees are just worried about whether or not they could even get their bonuses for March. But investors seem to be cheering this news today because Meta shares are higher this morning after Bloomberg reported that Meta is planning a fresh round of layoffs. They're going to cut thousands of employees as soon as this week, and the word is that they want to do this before Mark Zuckerberg goes on parental leave for his third child. Now, this will be the second round of layoffs in four months. Back in November, the company cut 13% of employees. And this is Mark Zuckerberg's year of efficiency. This is what he was talking yeah, about wow, wow. when he called it this. Right, it's pretty rough. But the company wants to do these layoffs really quickly. Now, some things that have been dings in this stock, even though it's up on the year, is that it's seen a slowdown in ad revenue. It's been asking directors and VPs to make lists of employees that can actually be let go. But hey, I wonder if any of those guys put themselves on those lists because the word is apparently separately that they've been planning to give more leaders uh, payouts and they're trying to flatten the organization as well. Mm. Um, and so this is just something that the company or not just the company, but investors are awarding the company for being able to do this and drive efficiency and cut down on its costs.
so far, uh, that's been the case. Uh, it looks like maybe they're going to try that again here today with the shares pretty firm so far. Uh, but it does just to signal really a, a different type of business. The sort of hyper growth days, obviously long past for oh, Meta. Yeah. I think after they kind of uh, uh, bungled the transition a little bit to this new metaverse business, uh, people are kind of happy to see this. But mm -hmm. Ultimately, when you've got a, a workforce now that's like what, a quarter of what it used to be, mm -hmm. clearly uh, you're not going to be uh, uh, growing at the same rate. So we'll see what the market prioritizes. Um, we've also got some earnings to talk about. Give us the heads up here for Dix and the stock that came into this report at uh, year-long highs. Yes, year-long highs. Now, Dick Sporting Goods is up today on better than expected fourth quarter earnings. Same store sales more than double from what analysts expected. And then the company gave an outlook that was above expectations. Adjusted earnings per share came in at 293 on revenue of 3.6 billion. Its comp sales increased 5.3%. That was more than double the analyst estimate of 2.1%. And the company said that the most popular products, can you guess them? Golf clubs. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. I mean, it was footwear, <laughs> athletic apparel, and team sports products. That yeah. that was were the most popular products. And so this company, it's been pretty resilient. Kid stuff, basically, kid right? Kid stuff, you know. Yeah. You got to get the little leagues in there, right? Mm -hmm. So this company has been pretty resilient during the pan. There you, there goes the, there goes the. <laughs> Doing the golf swing. Doing the golf swing. <laughs> uh, but even with the industry inventory struggles, um, Dick Sporting Goods has been able to weather those, but it hasn't it's not like it's been completely out of the clear because it's had its own set of inventory struggles. It would be a good idea to stock up on things, but only when it got there was out of season already. So they've had to get rid of inventory as well. And I'm assuming they've probably had to put discounts just like every other company, but they feel like they're in a better position now and they'll be able to deal with those inventory struggles mm. going forward. That's a good thing about golf is, uh, you know, you just go where it's warm, <laughs> always in season. All right, that was a chip, by the way. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks for you for the update. Dick Sporting Goods looking pretty good. Meta, we'll see how the market handles it. Big layoffs happening. We'll dive into the earnings in some more detail there for the Sporting Goods biz. First, let's talk about companies that are cash flow heavy and stable. If you're looking for ports in the storm, our next guest might have an ETF for you. Whether you're an experienced investor or just getting started, TD Ameritrade offers a webcast that's right for you. Looking to improve your portfolio management skills? Our portfolio management webcast series breaks down key concepts like retirement planning, income generation, ETFs, and more. Best of all, you can ask questions by chatting directly with an education coach. It's interactive learning at its finest. Tune in live or watch on demand. Head over to tdameritrade.com slash webcast and start learning today. Swim by TD Ameritrade is more than a trading platform. It's an entire trading experience that pushes you to be even better. It just might change how you trade forever. Because once you experience Thinkorswim by TD Ameritrade, there's no going back. Oh, yeah. Now, you downloaded the TD Ameritrade mobile app? Actually, I'm taking one less look at my dashboard before we board. And you have Thinkorswim mobile? So I can finish analyzing the risk on this position. You two are all set. Choose the app that fits your investing style. I'm Nicole Petalides, live on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, empowering investors every single market day. Tune in to the TD Ameritrade Network.
Dr. Mix this morning ahead of Jay Powell. We're going to hear from him in roughly about 45 minutes. Let's talk about the big picture and then dive into an ETF with the team at Zach Salas Posito, ahead of ETF Ooh, Products and Zach's Investment Management. Sal, good morning. Thanks for being here. Good morning, Oliver. Thanks for having me. So we've got the Fed chair today. It seems like much of the big moves the last month and a half have been pretty specifically centered around him. What's kind of your baseline expectation? And how does it inform what you guys do at Zach's, what the central bank does? Yeah, I mean, we're obviously constantly watching and taking the data in from the Fed and from, from kind of everywhere, right? We're leveraging our sister company, Zach's Investment Research, to constantly uh, rank and re-rank these companies based on earnings revisions and earnings estimates. When it comes to the Fed, we're, we're kind of feeling that uh, 50 basis points more is kind of where we're going to end up, but that, that that's going to long-term kind of have an effect on, on the growth rate of these companies. Right now, the uh, stock market has been in this kind of uh, recovery mode since October. Things got a little kind bit crappy here at some junctures, but overall tech still generally leading. And uh, hmm. when we think about compared to last year, of course, it's basically been the opposite of the bear market. So when you kind of look at what happened when we started this year versus last year, what's generally kind of the view? Do you think that we're going to be looking more like 2022 or more like something that happened in this uh, bull bounce the last several months? Yeah, I think we we're, we generally feel that uh, we're going to be in for some stormy waters ahead we think that it's going to be more more so like 22 and that's kind of why um we we do feel that we have uh you know a, a great process for active management that can kind of weed out those pockets of opportunity um in the market what you guys do at the earnings consistent portfolio seems pretty interesting and pretty telling uh, for what people want right now. We've heard a lot of demand for uh, steady businesses, dividend payers. What are you looking for in that fund? Yeah, right. So the, the, everything starts with a company's balance sheet, in our opinion, right? We feel that a company that can weather uh, the storm in different markets um, starts at their balance sheet and their fundamentals. Their ability to manage their cash is kind of what we're looking at directly, right? And what we do is we rank and re-rank them every single day uh, utilizing our analysts over at Zach's Investment Research to help us kind of look for those forward-looking opportunities. Tell us about your uh, filtration system. Uh, well, how, how do you sort through uh, S and P 500? Is uh, or are you going beyond to mid caps? What's the universe? Yeah, so the universe on this ETF is actually we're we're looking at the largest names and the most liquid names. So right, so think of the top 750 uh, companies in the market. Um, we aren't we aren't touching on any mid caps and small caps in this particular portfolio, but uh, you know we're looking for we're looking for companies that are large with a large cash reserve and they're and and they manage their money effectively uh, on their balance sheet. And uh, how, how do we define effectively? Do they need to be a certain number of like quarters cash flow positive? Do they need to be earnings uh, profitable? What about a gap versus adjusted? That's basically the yeah. whole story of the cloud world. People will still say, hey, we're adjusted if you take out stock-based comp. Yeah, no, so uh, we, are, we are particularly looking, actually, we, we're looking for a 15-year track record as well. Uh, that's kind of one of the first screens that we're screening for this portfolio is, has this company earned consistently? Has their balance sheet been strong and stable throughout multiple market cycles, right? So that kind of gives investors and advisors uh, a way to kind of peek in through the lens, even though it's a fairly new ETF, to kind of see, okay, these are companies that are earning, uh, their, their earnings are consistent throughout multiple market cycles, like 2020, 2008, even sometimes 2000, some of our companies are, you know, have been around that long. Okay. Right now, uh, is there any sector that is skews towards or any theme that uh, is prevalent in the fund? Well, no, we, we're kind of uh, thematic uh, agnostic, right? I think uh, from our perspective, right, obviously energy has done quite well the last few years, but you're not going to see energy in this portfolio, particularly because there isn't an, an earnings consistency uh, amongst energy companies, right? At least uh, I haven't found one yet. Uh, that may be the case, you know, going forward with these different alternative energies coming out. But currently, right now, there is no there's no energy in in the portfolio because of the 
the mm. rigorous screen that we do on consistency. Wow. And uh, I guess, uh, yeah, it's your point. I mean, if you need a long track record, it was uh, just a, a year and a half ago, about two years ago, and uh, all these companies are uh, on the borderline when crude went negative. So, okay, fair enough. I see some of the big tech names you've gotten there. Some of them uh, you're missing. Apple and Alphabet, Microsoft are in your top uh, 20. No Meta, no Tesla. Um, what about Tesla? Is that just too new in terms of profitability as well? Exactly, right. Okay. So that, that's the number one reason, right? That it's just too new in terms of their consistent, you know, their earnings consistency. Right, and the track record just isn't there yet. And also Meta, right? It doesn't kind of meet our quality screen quite yet. Um, so that's kind of why you're not seeing those two big names in there. How about the finance uh, group? It looks like banks and financials have a pretty big constituency uh, in the fund. Is there a, a risk here though, if we've got a deepening inverted yield curve? I mean, do you think about that stuff? Do you make any adjustments based on uh, what's happening in the, in the present as uh, uh, a sort of uh, risk uh, uh, potential? Yeah, so we so we kind of the way we you know view risk with this portfolio is kind of uh, by leveraging, like I mentioned, our our Zach's ranking system. The the Zach's ranking system has been around almost close to fifty years. Uh, our sister company, Zach's Investment Research, and we're constantly looking uh, and re-ranking these names um, every single day over there, and and we are taking a look into whether or not something would be. You know, would qualify as risky. We would tend to avoid it, right? And I think, uh, from a financials perspective, right, we are obviously, like I said, looking at those specific criteria where it comes to 15 years track record, uh, consistency over that time period, and also analyst uh, analyst estimates and revisions of their earnings. Okay, well, uh, makes sense to see a lot of staples in here: Pepsi, mm -hmm. Procter and Gamble. Hershey, which has been a big winner, so those with the most established and historical earnings consistency. All right, uh, Sal, thanks for the run through. Appreciate it. No problem. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Sal Esposito, head of ETF products at Zach's Investment Management. All right, so looking for businesses with a long track record of making money. All right, coming up, let's talk some more stocks here on the move ahead of the bell. We're going to check in with Renita on Costco as well. A little update on DraftKings, too. Cruiser is going to join us from the New York Stock Exchange as we talk about that JetBlue merger potentially not happening. But that's been quite a bit of back and forth on that, so it's still not determined just yet. Watchlist can help you keep track of securities you're interested in. To add a watchlist to the left sidebar, select the plus sign, then watchlist. When the default list appears, select the name box, then create watchlist. Enter a watchlist name. To begin adding securities, enter a ticker symbol in the symbol box, then select enter. Continue adding all the symbols you want in your watchlist, then select save. The existing list is replaced by the new one. You can also create watch lists from the Market Watch tab. After creating a watch list, you can add symbols to it from different locations across the platform. From the Charts tab, select the list icon and then add to watch list. From the Scan tab, right click a security and then add to watch list. And that's how you make a watch list. For more demos on how to think or swim, head to the Education Center on tdameritrade.com. Think or Swim by TD Ameritrade is more than a trading platform. It's an entire trading experience. With innovation that lets you customize interfaces, charts, and orders to your style of trading. Personalized education to expand your perspective and a dedicated trade desk of expert level support that will push you to be even better and just might change how you trade forever. Because once you experience Think or Swim by TD Ameritrade, there's no going back. 
Trading has changed forever as a new generation of investors make their impact on markets. It's more important than ever to navigate through the frenzy of meme stocks, IPOs, and the next wave of tech. And that's where we come in, discussing strategies and example trades on Trending Games. Take control of your financial future. Next Gen Investing, weekdays at 1 p.m. Eastern, only on the TD Ameritrade Network. Whether you're an experienced investor or just getting started, TD Ameritrade offers a webcast that's right for you. Are you an active trader? Our active trading webcast series is designed to help you develop a deeper understanding of technical analysis, options, futures, and more. Best of all, you can ask questions by chatting directly with an education coach. It's interactive learning at its finest. Tune in live or watch on demand. Head over to tdameritrade.com slash webcast and start learning today. Stocks mixed right now as we've got totally unch futures. Zero, zero, zero for the NASDAQ, Russell, and the S&P. It's a little bit of tension ahead of the Fed chair coming out about the speech in front of Congress right now. Let's keep talking to some companies. Young, our senior markets correspondent, joining us from the newsroom for another update. Here, let's keep talking the consumer. Uh, you know, let's talk some Costco here. What's the latest? Well, right now, Costco shares are higher after an upgrade over at All right, North folks, let the games begin. Let me change this screen real quick. Let's see what they are, what they up to this morning. Let me bring the other screen in. This stock is. The, or it's all right, perfecto. This is all the things we need. I got one put out there, y'all, and I needed to go down to two something. So we'll see what's happening. Anything under two ninety nine or two ninety nine is great. So we need to see what Jerome Powell is going to say and do today, and we'll, we'll go from there. And you can thank. So I hope everybody is here. Hey, everybody. Good morning. Hey, Kaden. Hey, Elle. Hi, Eliana. I think it's Kadian. I hope I got that right because I'm a stickler for names, but I will get it. Hey, Kathy. Hey, Nyrell. Hey, Nicole. Oh, my gosh. Hey, everybody. So I'm not sure who's in here with me now or what, but are we going to watch for a few minutes? Um, I just want to check on this one. I got one little contract out there. Yeah, I think I spent $300 um, on this put. And so I'm expecting and I need the price to go down, which is doing. So as long as we... I think we were at a high, well over 300 the other day, 304 $303. So if it goes down, great. Um, I didn't pay too much for this contract. So, you know, it is what it is. So what I do want to do, though, is sometime today, maybe after the Fed chairman speaks. Hey, Latoya. Hey, girl. Y'all, we need to look at these. Um, contracts. I'm going to switch out just so you guys can see the profit that we made because right now, okay, this is good for my real money, What what's happening, but it's not good for those contracts that we, the practice contracts. So what I do want to do is go over and close out those practice contracts because I want to preserve our, um, I want to preserve the profits that we made on those contracts because I want somebody to go over those contracts with us too. So I'm going to switch you guys out to the drive. Um, hold tight. And then I'm going to switch over to my paper account real quick. Make sure I got this right. Here. So hold tight, folks. I'm switching out. Of their Cheers income screen. to placing wagers, they can place a bet on just about anything. Oh, now. tight! Just and I'm going to switch over to my paper account real quick. 
election, which is one of the hottest bets right now, apparently, the 2024 election. Uh-huh. And so this analyst is pretty confident hey. in DraftKings' long-term prospects. Uh, um, it is all this? also given the okay. declining consumer acquisition costs and the company's ability to grow mm. at about 20% or higher over the next several years. I have to decide, um, too, if I want to hold on to this put. It's having greater customer retention mm-hmm. as well. Now, meanwhile, there was an announcement today that DraftKings is launching. I am going to hold on to it to the announcement because I have a feeling that this announcement is going to tank the market. I don't know, but we will see. So either way, I'll make a decision what I'm going to do with this put later today. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and switch over to our paper account so we can go ahead and get started. So we can get started talking trader talk. I hope <coughs> I hope you guys were able to check out what's his name? Oliver Velez. Oh my God. I'm smitten. I'm telling y'all, I got a new boyfriend. Oliver is the truth. If you don't know who Oliver Velez is, do yourself a favor. Go check him out. I mean, like right now. I'm gonna wipe this screen, you guys the camera so it'll be nice and clear um but oliver velez is the man oh i know what and i'm logging into paper money now so we can go and practice together so if you don't have a paper account please set up a paper account oh shoot Oh, sure. Okay, I know. Do I know my login? Okay, we're getting logged in. Perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. So today I will try. I'm doing something I don't like to do, which is trade my money and teach at the same time or go over stuff at the same time. So I'm going to be checking on my account throughout the day as well because right now it's a little bit over three hundred dollars and remember i needed to go down to two something and it's dropping but let's get over here and look at our paper money real quick and so you guys can see what we did on thursday i'm gonna have somebody look at these accounts for us so let me pull it back in so you all can see what the paper money is doing we did good. I should have I should have did those. I should have taken those. Lord, Lord, Lord. I should have I should have put my money on them paper ones cuz we would be sitting pretty. Okay, let's see. I'm going to share this screen. Okay. All right. So here's our paper money account. I hope you can see it. And so far today, I'm like, we haven't done anything, y'all. And we up $400 in those paper accounts. It's incredible. I wish I was making it up. I just need y'all to see it. So here are the three puts that we purchased. And somebody said, well, how much did you pay for them? They were a little pricey. Okay, you can see $795. That would have been, so that's $795 for one contract. So we actually dropped $3,000 on those y'all, but we made $3,000. Wait a minute, no, that's not right. No, 795 times 100, 795, eight times three is 240, something like that. I'll figure it out. Nyrell asked me that. And then these are the other three that we bought. We paid 650 for these. So actually it was 650. And either we paid 650 or 1800, one of the two. I can't remember, but I will figure it out. So here are the profits for those two. These were the puts that we purchased. And you can see we still have a day left on these contracts. The puts by now I would have sold because you could see we were down by so much. You should never let your account get down. You know, that's the profit and loss percentage. You never want to lose like that kind of money, 97%. You never want to be down 88%. So, but just for the sake of, I think we were trying to see how price would be affected depending on what strike price we picked. So these two, these were just good trades, y'all. That's all I can say about that. And if the market continues to go up, you can see they're just making money fist over dollar, fist over fist, but these aren't losing too badly. So, so far 2160, that's 160 
$180 we lost between three contracts. And again, this is paper money. The reason we picked these, we were picking different strike prices. We were picking different deltas just to see how they were affected. But I'm not going to worry about the losers too much. I think we'll have plenty of time. Matter of fact, I'm going to sell our losers right now. So let me create a closing order. I'm going to get rid of them because I, I want to just focus on the ones that were successful. And then, well, I'll leave one of the losers so we can have somebody evaluate it. But I already know what happened. We should have never been in puts anyway with the market looking the way it was. It was clearly. Okay, so we sold those. Let me go back. We're up 1700 bucks, y'all. Won't he do it? Won't he will? Okay, for the yeah, for this trade period. Let's get rid of this one. Because it's losing money too. Let me see. I'll dump this one. Oh, yeah. We can have somebody help us evaluate those trades, too. I'm creating a closing order. Done and done. Okay, let's go back over here. We're up. And so if I get rid of all of them, it'll really reflect. Let me go ahead and do that. I'm going to get rid of them. We can do more puts once the market starts going down. Let me get rid of those. Okay, so we're only left with the calls that we purchased, and that's what those calls have made so far, $5,826. So far today, they've made whatever these two figures are. Okay, so that's where we are. We can go and you can even see what we pay for them. Let's see. This is where the trade is now. I have to add the trade price. At any rate, let's look at the chart and see what's happening. Apparently, the price is kind of going up. Come on, QQQ. All right. So here we are today. Oh, yeah. See, y'all going to make me go over there and get a call. Oh, Lord. That's a nice little start. The RSI isn't up too high. You can see, did you see this crossover right here? It's just beginning to cross over. We've got these two nice big volume bars, lots of volume coming in. The RSI was down here. That would have been a good place, like first thing this morning, to get a call because the RSI was so low, bounced up. This, yeah. Ooh, wee. Let me get on the two minute. I added a two minute. Most of you all know I usually trade on the three, the five. I look at the one, but I've been watching Oliver Velez and he suggested a two minute time frame. And quite frankly, I like the two minute time frame. So let's look at this on the two. Yeah. Two minute. At one point, it opened at three, like 301, 384. Lord, Lord, Lord. Is it going to be one of those days? I'm just, I don't want to, well, that RSI is up too high for me to be talking about getting in at a call. Mm. Okay, so if you are here for the first time, good morning, Doris. Hey, Johnny. Hey, Nyrell, I'm glad you're back. <laughs> I'm so glad you watched my boyfriend today. I'm telling you, he's good. He makes it, I like because he talks about patterns. He keeps it simple. It's not a lot of technical talk, but it's good information. Honestly, I feel like I'm a better trader already just from, you know, just from that little bit of time. Yeah, so let's get over here. This is our paper trading account. Um, I have resolved myself. I won't trade today. Uh, it's just not good for me to split my attention. I only have one put out there and it's got a little bit of time left on it. So I won't sell it unless things get crazy. If it gets above like 304, you know, 302, if it starts getting in that range, then I would, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Again, I spent $300 on this contract. It's not a lot of money, but you know, I don't like to sell at a loss ever. Okay, so if you have any questions, let me know, drop them in the chat, and I'm just going to go over what I see. 
and then I'll go over kind of like what I do in the morning. And I've changed my morning to really kind of look at what Oliver said. Okay. Also on this chart, I don't have my uh, moving averages. So I'm going to add them and I'll show you how to do that. Um, quickly, let's talk about what we're looking at. I trade QQQ. And if you look right here in the corner, let me see. I want to make sure I can see what I'm showing you guys. If you look right here in the corner under the word charts, you'll see QQQ. That's the equity that I trade. Let me move over so you guys can see my watch list. I rarely trade anything else. I know um, experienced traders, you know, they trade anything. They trade whatever is winning. They trade whatever their hearts desire. I personally, since I'm learning, I stick to one thing. I just want to master everything. I think by jumping around from equity to equity, I think it'll take you longer to make sense of it. By studying QQQ every day for the last five months, I've been able to kind of isolate characteristics of this equity. I understand she's active in the morning. She lays down and takes a nap in the middle of the day, unless there's some news. And then she's active again in the afternoon. That might be true for more than just QQQ. I think that's just the trading kind of rhythm of the trading day. So you'll see that you'll see large volume, you know, bars in the morning and you'll see them get small in the afternoon and they'll pick up later in the day. So let me show you yesterday and I'm going to switch it to maybe a five minute time frame so you can really kind of see what I mean by the volume. So any day will do. Let's look at this day. Just so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. You see how tall these volume bars are? And then you see they are markedly, you know, they're short. And then at the end of the day, you get these big spikes. That's kind of how the trading day flows. It happens like that every day. Lots of activity in the morning. The volume kind of dies down. They say all the traders are at lunch. And then you'll see it pick up at the end of the day. Folks are selling off, doing all kinds of things. Same true here. You'll see that same pattern. Lots of activity in the morning. Doesn't mean prices jump. It's just lots of activity, lots of volume. Um, slows down in the day. You see these little peaks. God only knows what happened. Why that volume kicked up like that. But that's generally the way it goes. Lots of activity in the morning, dies down in the middle of the day. Then it gets busy in the afternoon, kind of consolidating in the afternoon. So let me show you a typical day where you can see, I want you to see everything. I want you to see movement. I want you to see consolidation. Mm, that was a whole day of consolidation there. And consolidation usually looks like a flat line. Mm. I don't know. Let's see. These stocks have been active. Let's see if I do it on a 15. Can we see it any better? Well, she shimmied up all day that day. This was nothing but consolidation. Um, okay, here's a good one to look at. So you can see the market was really choppy. Then we had a little upswing because these each candle, I have my chart on a 15 minute. Each candle has 15 minutes. What? Hmm. Let me know if you guys can see this picture. Hey, Miss Vice. Hey, Kathy. I'm glad you guys are back. Drop in the chat for me if the picture goes out because one of my screens is spinning, but it doesn't. It looks like my other laptop. Okay. So we're talking about what a typical, the rhythm of a typical day is. And this is sort of typical. You got lots of activity here in the morning. You got this uptick. You can see, you know, this would have been a good time to buy a call. That's 15, 20, you know, 30, 45. That's 60 minutes, an hour of, you know, price going up. Somebody made some money. And then you see price coming down. And then you just see this sideways kind of trading. It was really nobody trading in there. I wouldn't be. Somebody could, but I don't. This is called consolidation, where you see this kind of sideways movement. So uptrend, downtrend, consolidation. 
that's all there ever is. There are only three things the market can do. The price can go up, the price can go down, and the price can just stay where it is, stay sideways and kind of trade in this little range. You will see that almost every day, um, especially with QQQ. But there are some days when she shoots up and that's all she does. There's some days when it's just a down day. I can show you one of those too, where it was just all up or all down. Oh yeah, see, this was an all up day. Just up, 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 little pullback, little consolidation up. I love these days. Oh my gosh. I think this was Thursday. Yeah, that was the day we purchased those calls that did so well and then this was yesterday i got in on this up y'all um it was good too and i think i had a put i got paid coming and going on this day which was really nice so today price is just going up you can see so let's i'm going to take this down our time frame is located at the top i was looking at it on the 15 minute but um I hope your screens don't look cloudy like that. Why does my screen look so cloudy? Mm. So let's look at today. I'm going to break it down to the, I'll do it on the three minute. Mm -hmm. So here is what has happened with price so far today with QQQ. Up top on your chart, you've got candlesticks. I'm talking about basic stuff. Can't consolidation means it stays the same yet. Yes, it trades in a range. So I'll show you consolidation again, and we can look at the price too, Nyrell. Um, Let's find some consolidation. There was a whole day of consolidation. Here, this. Let's see. You see how the price just doesn't change much? I'm going to use this line here. It's around 299 um, it never goes above 303. That's consolidation. That price stays within that range. Um, let's see. Two. Yep. It just doesn't go very far. It doesn't go up or down very much. If you follow this line, I'll place it right under these candles. This line represents the price along the side of this chart is the price of the equity. So to, you know, 298, 299 up to 300. So it's really only a two, you know, a dollar 50 difference here. But this would be called consolidation because the price isn't going up or down really. Um at the low we're 299.17 and you know, let me see if I can find another. This is not consolidation. That might be helpful, too, to show you a non-example. This would be considered an uptrend, period, all of this. This would be a period of consolidation. And then you see it breaks up. And then it consolidates a little bit, and it breaks up some more. So there are only three kinds of movement that you'll see in the market, just like this. This is 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, 21, 24, 27. 27 minutes of the price going up. It started at 294.85 and it got all the way up to two, almost 297. So uptrend, see if we can find you a downtrend. It's so simple. You'll know it when you see it. It's like, oh, the price is going down. Uptrend, up, up, up. And right here, this would be considered consolidation. Does that make sense? Look at that. All, just sideways, sideways, sideways for 3, 6, 9, 12, 18. All this time from 233 all the way to 133 for a solid hour. Not very much change in the price. 289.83 up to 290. You know, just not a lot of movement. This is what we're looking for. This is where we're making money. When the price goes from 290 all the way up to 293, a $3 move, that's what you want to see. And that would be an uptrend. I'm going to see if I can find a downtrend. Oh, I can find you one really clearly. This, this time in between here, you know that I'm speeding past you guys. This is pre market and, you know, aftermarket, the gray, the black. 
spaces are actual the trading day. And you'll be able to tell because you'll be able to tell by the volume. Volume right here tells you how many people are in the market. The color of the bar tells you who's in control. Red bars tell you that sellers are in control. The green bars represent buyers. And okay, so here is a downtrend. You can see price was here. And then now we're all the way down here. So we started at like 292.83 and we went all the way down to 291. But we've got better, more strong trends than that because there was one day it was all up and down. I'm going to switch it to the five minute. We may be able to see the trend a little better. Let me pull out. So that's all we're going to do today is keep it really simple. Um, we'll talk about, you know, anything you guys want to talk about. Perfect. Um, Kathy posted. Yes, please go check out Oliver Velez. Who we? I don't know. He did it for me, y'all. I was like, so, so give me an Oliver Velez, please. <laughs> please, ma'am. Yes, and thank you. I like smart guys. He, you know, he knows what he's talking about. And I'm okay with that. Okay. So let's look at yesterday, because yesterday, if I do it on the 15 minute, I think you could really see it. Nope. Let's try it on the 30 minute. And when I'm changing these time frames, the only thing I'm doing is looking at the day in 15 minute segments, one minute segments. So the candles represent the same price action, but they just break it down. So let's look at... Um, I want a 30 minute. I think in 30 minutes, you can definitely, this was, this was yesterday. Okay. This is clear. So on yesterday, I traded yesterday. I caught all of this up. I got a call first thing in the morning. I got all of that. And I actually did pretty good because I bought three contracts and I sold one and made a nice profit. I should have sold two, being greedy. I did not. I sold one and made a nice profit. I held on to the other two and messed around and I let them run like kind of almost down to here on this candle. And I got out with a profit, but not nearly as much as I would have gotten out had I sold at least two of them here and left a runner. And by leaving a runner, I mean you leave one in just in case it continues up, but you want to capture some profits, so you sell. So here's clearly an uptrend. You might consider that a little consolidation, that sideways trading, and then a clear downtrend. So uptrend, consolidation, downtrend. That's all the market can do. It can go up, it can go down, it can go sideways. That's it. Let's pick apart the things that you're looking at on this chart. These are called candlesticks. Everybody knows what a candlestick is. Candlesticks represent price action. I'm going to blow this up a little bit so you can see it a little better. Oh, yeah, that's a good view. And again, we're talking about this is what happened yesterday. We'll get back to today. It's just kind of bouncing around. It said $300.50. That's just bouncing around. It got, I don't think it got above 301 this morning and it bounced around a little bit below 300. So it's just chopping. Okay. So to begin across the top, you'll see this gear shift. Right next to the gear shift is the time frame. If I click on that, if you're following along, you can click that. And a pop-up menu or drop-down menu comes. When I do it, you guys can't see it on screen. It won't show you my drop-down menu. But my drop-down menu came down. And I have all these different time frames. So you can look at these candlesticks by one minute to any time interval that you like. Most people who are scalping, that means they're getting in and out. They are probably going to look at the five minute or less, maybe 15 minutes. But if you're scalping, you're getting in and out of a trade really quickly. You don't need to 
monitor during that trading time, the weekly, the monthly, the yearly, that's not going to help. Um, I don't scalp as much as I used to, although scalping was very profitable for me. It, it just moves so quickly and you got to be right. You know, it's a bunch of in and out. You can get in and get out. I like scalping. You can make money, but it does move quickly. And generally scalpers are first thing in the morning. They get in, they get out, they're done by 11 o'clock. Definitely by noon, they're done. I kind of like day trading because I like to be there. I like to look at it over time. And I think you can make a little bit more money day trading. Um, and then swing trading is a whole nother beast. Swing trading is when you hold a contract overnight. Oh, it shows you the drop down menu. Yay. Good. Okay. So here I had it on 30 minutes and let me just come out of the drop down menu. So each one of these candles represents 30 minutes. This is 30 minutes of trading. It's clear to see that it's green. It's got a nice body. These are called wicks. It's clear to see there was a lot. There were lots of traders. You can see how tall this bar is and the buyers were in charge. Same is true for the next 30 minutes. So for a whole hour and a half, to be truthful with you, that's that that was a that was a nice little trade. For a whole hour and a half, price just went up. It opened at three around three. Yeah. Oh wow. Around three hundred and nine three hundred dollars and ninety-five cents. It got as high as three hundred and three dollars and six. Well, actually, if you look at this candle. At one point, it got as high as 303.98. I, I want to say it was 304. So the lowest it was was $300.65. And I'm going to the very top of this wick. It got up to like 304. So that was a nice little move. Then it did some consolidating where the price didn't change very much. And then I caught this down part too, where the price just went down for. Oh, that's one hour, two hours, three hours. Almost the whole half of the day, the price went down. You can see the volume bars are red. They're nice and strong as well. So that was a very clear cut day. The beginning of the day was up, consolidated it. You know, like I said, around, look at that, 11 o'clock to about 12 o'clock, a whole hour and a half, maybe 1230. Just price chopping around, doing nothing. And then all this downside. So this would have been a great time to have a call. You purchase a call when you think the price is going to go up. You don't do much anything when the price is going sideways, although they do have an instrument that you can use. I don't trade it yet. It's an advanced trading strategy. I, I think it's a straddle or something, but you can make money on it if there's a range. For now, we're buying calls if the price goes up, puts if the price is going down. And one way to remember that is that when you call somebody, you pick up the phone. So calls are up. And when you're done, you put the phone down. So puts are for down. Pick up for calls, put the phone down for puts. Puts down, calls up. Um. And this indicator right here, these bars don't tell us anything except for how many people are actually trading at that time. And you can see this value right here. It'll tell you, I think that is millions, you all. One million. I don't know. It's a big number because there's a whole lot of people in the market at that time. I don't necessarily focus on the how many people. I look at the volume bars relative to one another. So I can tell that volume was waning. You can tell that traders and, you know, brokers, all these people are either at lunch, they're chilling somewhere. And then you can see volume picks up again. So I don't know that you need to focus on the actual number, but you do want to pay attention to if it's strong volume or weak volume. Strong volume is generally like you want to get on in on that. That means there are a lot of people are either purchasing or selling and that's momentum. And you can make some money with momentum. Okay. So now let's look. Why is this here? 
This is our Mac D. You'll see right here. And the Mac D really helps us indicate, it's a trend indicator. And you can see right here, as the price is going up, you see these bars here getting taller and taller and they're bright green. You see these two indicator lines getting further and further apart. That's a good sign. This is an indicator that this is a healthy uptrend. And then you can see where the bars start to change colors. And you can see where, uh oh, a little consolidation, the trend is changing. These turn to dark green, they get really tiny. Did you see this too? You see at first the blue line was on top of the yellow. There's a crossover here. And now we start this downtrend. Price is going down, 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 down. This crosses over. These bars now become red and you can see they're even underneath this line. Here in the uptrend there on top of the line, we have this crossover. Then they start to go underneath the line and they're red. They're also getting taller, taller, taller. These lines are spreading further apart. This is a healthy downtrend. You can see as the trend starts to change, these get darker. So when I tell you this is not rocket science, you're literally looking at colors, patterns, and relationships, I promise you. You're looking at indicators. You don't need your calculator. You don't need to buy you know, some fancy equipment, you're, you're just not doing that. This is observing the market and responding to it. Nyrell says, when you buy a contract, call or put, can you change the duration of the contract or you have to stay in it until the expiration you set when purchased? Absolutely not. You can purchase a contract that expires one day. They have contracts that extend all the way out for years. Those are called leaps. Those are long something. I forgot what L-E-A-P stands for, but those are long-term um, contracts. Even if you purchase one that expires in seven days, you can sell it whenever you get ready to. People will often purchase time to give a trade room to work itself out. I know plenty of traders who don't purchase any time at all, particularly if they're scalping or they're day traders. They only want a contract good for that day. And the advantage to buying shorter term contracts, contracts that expire today or in a couple of days, is that they're cheaper. The longer time that you purchase, if you purchase a contract that lasts for that's nine days, it's going to be more expensive than a contract that expires in one or two days. Same would be true if you purchased a LEAP that is a year out or six months out. Those contracts will just be more expensive. Oh, Lord, did this price drop down to two ninety seven? dollars Holy smoly cannoli. Excuse me, folks, but I need to go do something real quick. What the heck? I got to put. Y'all, excuse me, money's on the line. This is why I don't like to trade and talk at the same time, y'all. But I got to put, and as long as this price is going down like that, I need to sign out of this paper account and go collect this cash. I'll be right back. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> I promise you. Who are we going to get this money today? I've been waiting on that. I've been waiting on this put to go down, the price to go down. I had no clue it was going to do that. Okay. I'm going to take this out, and I'm going to put you all back on. Look at the um, wash my jiggy chart. <laughs> look at the um, this chart, y'all. Let me hurry up and get over here and get this money. I didn't got excited. That is crazy. Who would have thought the price would drop like that? Okay, let me, I'm going to put you on this other screen. It says present, cancel, share screen, share, Google Drive. Okay, y'all study for a second what the checkmate is. While I log out of this joint and go get this money real quick, I'll be, it won't take me 30 seconds. Okay, so maybe it'll take me two minutes because I got to log out of Thinkorswim and log back in. I'm so glad I saw that, Lord. Please don't let that price change. Let me get over here real quick. We made money. Who? Jerome Powell must be talking. There's no reason for that price to drop like that. 
Ooh. Okay. Sorry, y'all. I promise I'll be right back. <laughs> I'll tell you how the um I'll tell you how the calls went. I'll tell you how this put went. Yes, Doris, you already know I'm going to get that money. <laughs> I love y'all. Right back. Oh no, I did it again. I need to get out of here. I need to get into my money money account. Lord, don't let that price go up. Let it keep going down. Somebody type in the chat what QQQ is doing because I cannot see it. That is crazy. I'm going to look at it on Robinhood. That's why I keep my phone by me just to check the price. Yep, I don't want to miss it. Okay, and then we'll go over. That's going to affect those calls that we have in our um, paper account, which is cool. Because you all saw the profit. I should have sold those too, so we could have locked that in. But let me lock in the real money. We could talk about paper money. Ooh, did you say 296? God is good. Won't he do it? They are definitely profitable, young people. Okay. Um, you know, I don't usually share my money, but I'll share. They went, they're up a hundred. It's just one. I bought one contract. Girl, let me hear me sell this thing. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, whoa. Okay. Let me look. I gotta look and see. Thank you, L. It's two, yeah, it just went up to 297. Oh my gosh. I can't believe this. 296.06. Two. I'm gonna hang tight because it's still dropping. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm hang tight. 297.03, 297.01. Okay, so I will pull you guys back in now so you can see what I'm looking at and why I'm excited about it. Because as long as that price goes down, I'm going to also turn on the news because I got a feeling that it has something to do with Jerome Powell. And um, so let me pull you back in so you guys can see what I'm looking at. And, oh, that's such a good thing for us. See why I like trading? I'm sorry. I do. I like trading, y'all. I am so totally hooked. It just, it works for me. Okay, so here we are. The price is down to $296.75. Every, every penny it goes down, you get paid. I mean, I don't know what else to tell you. I need y'all to learn this skill, and you, you're learning it with me. You know, I'm, I can't be the I'm not the, oh, Lord, let's see, 296.90, mm, 296.88. <laughs> Talk after locking in. You already know. Oh. <laughs> 297, yeah, I'm out because it's going back up. 297.01, yeah, let me sell. Let me sell. Let me sell. Let me sell. Let me take y'all out because I, let me sell real quick. Let me see. And I'll tell you what it was. Are you sure you want to close the chart? Yes. Um, I'll tell you what we wound up. Yep. You see it going up. Let me hurry up and get my tail out of here. Create a closing order. Confirm. Send. Whew, we out. Easy money. Easy money. Easy money. Okay. Done and done. Um, let me see when I got out. The only thing is I only have one of them. And <clears throat> in an ideal world, you would buy at least two. So you sell one and you leave one just in case the price continues to drop. And I'm pretty sure the price is still dropping, but 
whatever. I say lock in the profit. See profit, take profit. <laughs> See money, take money. I too many times, you guys, I have left it, you know, hoping. Mm -mm. When you see the money, take it. So let me, I'm going to pull the chart back up and we can continue to watch. Let's see. We're going to get back to QQQ. That was cool. Yep. Easy breezy capizzi. That was sweet. That was so sweet. It don't always happen like that. Okay. So here we go. Let's go back and look at what happened. I told you I needed it to get under two, whatever. This is how the day started out. This is on the two minute time frame. So let's go ahead and look at the real deal because this is perfect. It shows consolidation and everything. Who won't he do it? Won't he will? Um, hold tight one second. See, I want to make sure you guys can see. Okay. So this is real, the real time, real account. Ooh, let me close this up. And you can see that I think we started the day out at two. It was just under $300. It opened up. And it went up for a little bit. Consolidation, consolidation. And for the life of me, I do not know what happened here. I'm going to assume that Powell is speaking. I'm going to switch over to the news in a second. And then down, 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 all the way down to 297.41. I didn't get out on this candle. I think I got out on this candle. So I gave a little bit back, but we are okay with that. So this is per this is what you want. That's two, four, six, eight, ten 10 minutes of price dropping. And look at this joker. I think what's going to happen is it'll go over and it may shimmy down some more. The only thing that makes me think otherwise is you can see how these bars are no longer bright red. They're dark red. It means the trend is changing. And you can see we got those buyers. Buyers came in. And so it was no longer a downtrend. You can also see with our RSI how we were well over sold. Yes. And then you can see it start to dip up. And who knows, this thing can continue down, but we got out at the perfect time because I would have given back all of this from, let's say from here, that's 296.54 to 297. You know, that's a nice little bit of money to give back. It doesn't seem like it, but it is. That's 296.64 to, that's almost a whole dollar. You know what a dollar means? That's a lot of money. So what could conceivably happen is that this thing can go up, look at it. It could shimmy down some more. It could shimmy down under 296. But we don't want to be greedy. <laughs> we don't want to be greedy. I will take that. I'll take the money that we made and be happy with that. So since we're over here, we might as well stay here. Um, I don't have a trade in in you know, don't have anything in so we can talk this is the live account um and that's better anyway because now i can show you the simple moving averages if there's anybody who doesn't know what a simple moving average is these lines represent price the price of qqq over time this pink one is my 50 day moving average. So all they do is they take the price of whatever equity you're looking at. It could be Apple, Tesla, they all work the same. And they average the price out over the last 50 days. And every day they drop one day off and add the new day, you know, the next day on. So it's like a running tally of the average price for 50 days. This, this is my, um, nine day simple moving average. This is my 13 day simple moving average. And it's exactly what it says. It's nine days of price. That's just the average. And they, you know, make a line to represent what the average price was. You all get that. This is the 200 day moving average. 
And the longer the time frame, the more significant that price level is. Because if you track something over 200 days, that data is going to be more be more impactful than the data from only nine days. That makes sense. That's like if you're tracking your budget over the whole year, you get a better picture of your spending habits as opposed to if you only track your budgeting over a week. That doesn't tell you a lot about yourself, but if you track your spending over the whole year, you really get a clear picture of where price is or how much you're spending. Party DJ, music DJ, um, play nice. <laughs> Please play nice. We're talking about money. That was so distracting. I've watched you in the chat before. So as long as you play nice, you can stay. <laughs> Party music DJ. Because I looked at your stuff and I can't tell who you are. That's always just a little sketchy for me. If I if you got a lot of content up and I can't tell who you are, hmm. But I'm a grandma. Does that help? <laughs> I'm a granny. All right. So what we're looking at now, you guys would be considered consolidation. You see that? Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. Price is flat. It isn't doing anything. That's it. Oh, Marilyn isn't here today. I'm sure she'll be joining us. Marilyn is our moderator. <laughs> she does that. We may have to name another. Um, but you can see what the candlesticks are doing. The candlesticks communicate to you what price is doing. They communicate to you who's in charge, the direction of price. I promise you, it's the easiest thing in the world. It is not difficult to understand what this chart is saying. This candle tells us what the price was in this two minutes, where it opened, where it closed. This candle tells us what happened in this two minutes. Price actually went up for two minutes. It went up for another two minutes. It went up for another two minutes. And then we got all this consolidation where it didn't make much movement at all. It stayed somewhere between $300 and 48 cent. And it got up to average roughly $300 and 87 cent. We didn't see a big sweeping change until here. So what I'm going to do right now, you guys, is bring in the tv part because i do i think all traders should trade with the news now on. down percent dollars 50 perhaps instead of 25 for the next fed hike starting to price that in yeah yep i think this is going to be in response to chairman powell's speech today i think he's going to be pretty hawkish and hawkish meaning that interest rates are going to continue to rise and that the market doesn't want to hear that necessarily because lots of price implications so let's just look at what we have here in front of us hey shauna hey my love that's my buddy in pv oh my gosh we had such a good time when we were in Puerto Vallarta, y'all. If you haven't been to Puerto Vallarta to get there, it is gorgeous, 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 gorgeous. Okay. So if you guys have any specific questions, let me know if you have any questions about um, price, what the candlesticks represent. We have volume here. We know that volume means how many people are actually trading at that time. And you can see a lot of people sold off, which is good for me because when people are selling, prices going down, when traders are purchasing and buying, you know, to acquire, you can see price going up. We got out just in time because now you can see prices starting to tick up. 297.80. Yeah, we got out at a good time. I don't know what the market was responding to. It had to be something in the news or something like that, because that's pretty unusual to have a drop off like that just in the middle of the day if it's not some news. And now you see prices creeping back up. You can also see that our moving averages, look at this, those crossovers are significant. When you see a crossover, you wanna pay attention. But also look at the RSI. RSI stands for Relative Strength Indicator. 
do not be confused. There's also an RSI that has a broader definition in trading. And I want to say that's the relative strength indicator. And there's a relative strength index. This is the indicator. These three things here are all called indicators. And we use indicators to help us make sense of what's happening in the market. We, that's all this is. All we're concerned about is what is price doing. That's all you're concerned about. Is the price going up? Is the price going down? Is the price staying sideways? We make money when the price goes down. Right here, somebody's making money. This would have been a perfect place to get in. It's still not too late to me, if you ask me on this trade, to get a call. Because you can see price clearly going up. You can see here for our MACD, the trend is changing. It looks like there's about to be a crossover right here, indicating a trend change. You can see the color change here in our TTM squeeze. I call this my lemon squeeze. I don't know why I got that in my head and I never, it never changes. But you can see this was red when the price was going down. You can see now that the price is starting to go up, the color changes. It, this is not, this is like coloring y'all. I promise you trading, the most difficult part of trading is managing your emotions and not being afraid to pull the trigger, getting in and getting out. I promise you, I think a trader has three main jobs, manage risk. And by manage risk, I mean, you have to be responsible. This is your money. You don't take your whole account and because you got a stock tip and drop all your money. That's irresponsible. Good traders manage risk. And that's what I'm working on. You understand risk reward ratio that I need to work on that. It's how much money are you putting into the market and how much can you potentially make? It makes no sense to put $5,000 into a trade when the maximum you can make is $100. That's not a very good risk to reward ratio. If you're risking $5,000 to make $100, not a, not a good risk reward ratio. Um, we can look that up together. We can talk about it. We can pull it up during the day, whatever you like. But you have to be able to, to understand what am I risking? You know, because it is a risk. You're putting your money out there. It's a calculated risk. You're totally in control. You can stop a trade anytime you get ready. You can sell anytime you get ready. Nobody's stopping you. You don't have to stay in a trade. If you see it not going your way, sell. So it's a calculated risk. Even if you put $10,000 out there, it's still a calculated risk because you control how long you let it stay out there. The only thing you can't control is, did you see how quickly that candle dropped? Two, four, six, eight, ten, ten 10 minutes. If you aren't paying attention, if you don't have stops set, things can change quickly. So you can lose money quickly if you aren't careful. So a good trader, number one, manages their own risk. That's your job. It is your job to protect your capital. That's why when we were talking over in paper trade, I don't have time. It is my job to get over there, collect those profits and get out of that trade in a timely manner. The other two things that I think any good trader has to do is you have to know how to get in. That's your entry. You've got to make a good entry and you got to know when to leave the party a good exit because that's how you control how much profit you take. When you get in the trade, you want it to be go, you know, you want to be pretty sure that trade's going to go your way relatively quickly. You don't want your money sitting out there just chopping around because you're losing money as it's doing that. A smart trader, or I won't even say smart, but a great trade today would have been someone who was able to read this and purchase a put somewhere around here. Even if you purchased it as this long candle was coming in, which I probably wouldn't have done. I like a confirmation candle. When I see, okay, we did, this came, this came, and here, oh yeah. I like to see confirmation of a pattern. And for me, confirmation would have been all this volume, looking here, this is all red, this is all red. I'm telling you right here, that would have been a nice little, 
a nice little entry. The RSI wasn't oversold yet. You were here. If you got in there, that was smart. And then you definitely want to make sure that you get out. You don't want to stay in the trade to this candle because look, that's pro that's going up. You've given all that money right back. So you got to know when to get in, when to get out, and how much money to put on the table. To me, that's it. That's all you got. That's all this is. The rest is looking at colors, looking at patterns, looking at relationships. And I love, love, love the way Oliver Velez breaks this down. Y'all, he talk, he. He talks my language, which is keep it simple, keep it brief. Nobody needs to know how much you know. We just need to know what we need to know. I don't like a teacher that is trying to impress me. Don't impress me. Educate me, please. I know you're smart. I know you're smarter than me. Great. Now's not the time. I don't need a sage on the stage. I need somebody who can communicate to me in a way I can understand, where I can make connections, I can ask questions freely and feel safe. That's what I need as a learner. I need somebody who's willing to explain things 15 times. Not the same way, but you're going to have to give it to me 12 different ways because to just say the same thing over and over again isn't helpful. So that's why I need you guys. If you've got questions for me, please put them in the chat. It is my pleasure to go over and I don't have any problem with somebody asking me the same question 10 times. Y'all know I taught kindergarten. I taught, actually I taught everything from pre-K all the way to fifth grade. Kids ask the same questions over and over again all day long. That's just the way we learn. You have to get practice and you just have to stick with it until the pieces make sense. So let's go ahead and do a slight kind of recap. Anybody who's been here with me before, understands this language. These are candlesticks. I've heard Oliver refer to these as bars. Candlesticks, bars, whatever you want to call them, they communicate to you price action. Of course, this long red candle, you can see price on the side going down. It went down from 300 all the way down to $296. Man, that was good. <laughs> The shape of the candles communicates something to you as well. This is a very powerful move. That's a lot of people selling off in two minutes. They continue to sell off for an additional two minutes, but look how small that candle is. Not nearly as much momentum, not nearly as much volume. And this candle here is an indicator to me that, hey, 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 price opened and closed really close. Sellers were still in charge, but that's an indicator to me to pay attention that the trend is not as strong. If we had a bunch of these long red ones, hooey, that's good. But this says, hey, pay attention. This trend may be getting ready to change. Then we get another relatively strong candle and we get this hammer. That is a definite indicator that, okay, because the price, it started out here, you guys, red, all red. And enough of the buyers came in that they pushed this price up. So that long wick at the bottom, that's buyers. Sellers came in here. This candle was all red at one time. It started filling in from the bottom, all red, and got up here. Then buyers came somewhere in two minutes. Think about that. And they pushed this price all the way from 296.80 all the way up to 297.15. That is significant. I'm not surprised that the next candle was green because this tells us buyers were, they were on it right here in this previous two minutes. So I'm not surprised that this candle's green. I'm not surprised that this one is green as well. But look at this wick. You see that long wick there? These buyers and sellers are duking it out. They're fighting. This long wick says sellers came in and pushed, well, price was, sellers came in and affected the price. Let me slow down. This one was sellers. This one was caused by buyers. You can just see them fighting. That's all these candles tell you. If you see a strong candle like this one, where it doesn't have a lot of wicking, that's just a solid two minutes of sellers being in charge. The wicks 
tell us that, wait a minute, somebody, they're fighting here. Somebody's pushing against what, what's happening here. So these candles also indicate this trend or this buying spurt, this two minutes, isn't nearly as strong as this. Strong body candles like this represent momentum, volume. Those are the ones you really want to see. And these are telling you, you know, you might want to get on your bicycle <laughs> because things are about to change. So I would suggest, please, 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 the Candlestick Bible is in the Google Drive. Familiarize yourself with candlesticks. The top candle, orange and green, is the equity price, not the value. Okay, so I know these candles probably look orange, but the I think the, the standard is that they're red and green. So any that you would always hear somebody say a red candle or a green candle to begin. And you said the top candle, orange and green. I'm not sure what you're talking about, but I'll go over this. Is the equity price not the value? Yes. The price that you see here is currently what that stock, and I say equity because some things are single stocks, like QQQ is not a single stock. QQQ is a conglomeration of many stocks put together. It's like the old mutual fund where you, you, know, you put all your stuff together and you kind of average out the price. That's what QQQ is. QQQ has Costco, Meta, NVIDIA, PepsiCo, Costco. All that stuff is inside of QQQ. It's heavy in tech. Um, so I'll try to go back over this. $299.23, if you wanted to purchase just one share of QQQ, you would pay $299.24. That's the current price. Um, price fluctuates throughout the day. It goes up, it goes down, it trades sideways. These candles, like let's take this green one. It's telling you in this two minutes, the price opened up at the beginning of the two minutes. You could purchase QQQ for $298.44. As the two minutes went on, the price of this equity got all the way up to 299.46. That's what the price did. You guys can see this here. Somebody this is money. If someone purchased a call right here, all of this is profit. You the price went from 296 or let's say roughly 297 to almost $300. Y'all, this is money, real money, and I'm telling you it's not rocket science. You buy the call here or here, more likely for me, I would have purchased it here, and you let the price go up, and then somewhere along the way, you sell it. All you want to do is sell a call for more than you bought it for. With a put, the price is here. You want the price to go down. You want the price to go down low. You want to see a $1, $2, $3 price drop. You want to sell it when the price is low. It's no more to it. Calls, we want to purchase them when the price is low. We want to sell them when the price is high. That's what you would do with any stock. The beauty of, I think, trading options is that we can make money when the price goes down. You can make money when the price goes up. If we were just buying shares of, say, Apple or Target or any other equity, if you're just buying shares, you can only make money when the price goes up. But, y'all, this is a thing of beauty. When you see these stair steps like this and you see these nice bodied candles with no wicking, honey, honey, that's, that's, that's money. That's, that's money. That's all I could tell y'all. Um Nyrell, I hope I answered your question. If not, can you rephrase your question or ask me some clarifying questions so that I can give you what you need? Man, oh man, oh man, this is a good day. I hope somebody is trading. I hope somebody is capturing this. 
I'm a pretty conservative trader. Like I don't jump in really quickly. I have to see, like I have to see because price uh, or these candles can respond to these moving averages. These are slicing right through. This is great momentum, but they don't have to go right through those. They can bounce off of them. They can sit on top of these lines because these are prices that this stock has been at for some time. Think about it. This is the average price for 50 days. So, you know, price is going to not just jump up. It's like the price of a home. Home prices don't one day the average house on your block is worth three hundred thousand dollars. And then 30 minutes later or two days later, the price is five hundred thousand dollars. No price respects, you know, that average. That's the way car prices are. It's just the way pricing of anything that you're selling works. Groceries, you don't go to the store one day and apples are a dollar a pound. And then you come back in the afternoon, apples is seven dollars a pound. No. Over time, price may creep up or over time, price will creep down. The same is true of these equities. You can look at the price over the last 10 years. Okay, I'm glad you got that. You can look at the price over the last 10 years and you will see a gradual increase or a gradual decrease. And that's what these lines represent, the average price over time. So you're not going to see these candlesticks just all willy nilly. They respond to price. So either when a candlestick is approaching a simple moving average, it can do three things. It can slice right through it like it's not there, but trust and believe it's not going to go far. Um, or it can reject off of that price level, meaning it just can't penetrate it. It can't go above it. It'll have some trouble. It'll get stuck there. That's kind of like what you see here. These are just kind of stuck here in this price zone until something happens. And trust me, something happened for this sell-off. Or they can sit on top of them like um, where this becomes a support. So price... These simple moving averages, these lines can act as support where the price just kind of sits on it. It can act as resistance where the price can't seem to get above it. It's just like a ceiling and price just kind of stays here. It's like, uh, can't break through or it can just go right through it. So you want to pay attention to that too. How are the candles moving and they'll cut through generally, like just have no trouble going through if they've got a lot of volume. If there's not a lot of volume, it takes a lot of volume to kind of just cut through those. So I hope that helps you guys just a little bit. And trust, we'll come back to all of this stuff. We talked about volume. We started and we touched on the RSI, the relative strength indicator. And the relative strength indicator, again, if you look at it, it tells us when we are oversold, like sellers came in and they sold, sold, sold. Look, we got down under this value of 30. Oh, what was it? It's really low. And you can see it was oversold. Too much selling. Price is not going to withstand that. It's not going to dip that low. It's not going to deviate very much from these averages. And so it was oversold. Price wants to respect these averages. That's just, that's life. Nobody is going to be paying more or, or buying and paying more than they need to. So you can see price kind of corrects itself and gets back closer to these lines. And you can see it went all the way from the bottom up to the top. Here's what you want to see on your RSI. Here's where the money is made from the bottom to the top. That's all this thing does all day is it races from the top to the bottom, from the bottom to the top. You want to make sure, or if possible, if your RSI is way down here, just like this, you know that eventually that price is going to go up. And if the price is going up, you want to buy a call. So I'm always interested when that RSI gets way down here. And look at that. Doesn't that make sense? 
anybody who bought a call right here, they got the benefit of this price going up. Well, our RSI is telling us price is oversold. Y'all better get over here because it's got to go back up. And sure enough, from the bottom, almost to the top. And when you see it up here, a smart person, once you see this red candle, would have gotten out of this trade. You don't have to trade all day. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. That's 20 minutes. Make your money and go to the beach. <laughs> Make your money and go to the beach. Like you all, if we weren't doing this, I would shut this computer down. This 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. That's, that's 12, 15 minutes. I made enough money today. Me and Nyrell, we could go out. <laughs> Nyrell's here with me too in GDL. We could go have lunch. We could do whatever we want to do with the money we just made in 20 minutes. Is it, did I make $1,000? No, I only had one $300 contract, but did I make enough money to do what I need to do today? I sure did. Yes, I did. And think about it. You could do that all day. We could have took this trade. I could have sold that put and said, oh, look, here comes another opportunity. I'll take this trade and purchase this call. You can do that all day if trades present themselves. This is not a good trade right here. Nobody should be, why? There's nothing here that would indicate to me that it's time to buy. You've got green, red, green, red. It's just chopping about. It's not a lot of volume here. Nothing's really happening. You know, look at this. Even on my MACD, these are so low. Nothing's happening. We want to see this. You see these big old candles? You see that big old volume? You see the sweeping change? We, this just sitting here side by side, side, that's nothing. We don't want that. We want to see these big deviations. That's what you're looking for. That's why I said trading, anybody can trade if you got common sense. If you're not an emotional wreck, <laughs> if you're reasonably healthy mentally, you don't have to have a million dollars to do this, y'all. I had one contract. I paid $300 for it. And for some people, that's expensive. I had that contract was that expensive because I always buy time. I buy time because I'm a new trader. If the trade doesn't work out today, I like to have four or five days where I can sit back and it's, you know, no big deal. If this big move didn't happen today, I still had a day or two left on that contract where, you know, maybe the price will go down to my level tomorrow. If it doesn't go down tomorrow, maybe it'll get to my price level the next day. I do that because I'm a new trader. But experienced traders that are scalpers, they don't spend that much money on a contract. The same contract that I purchased, they might only spend $75 on that contract because they get it for one day. But the, the downside to that is if that contract, does, if that trade does, if the price doesn't do what you need it to do in that one day, uh, you just lost that money or you will lose a portion of it. Whereas if you buy time, if it doesn't work out on Monday, you still got till Friday. So you just have to weigh it out. The pro to buying time is that you give yourself time for the trade to work out. The con is that the contract will cost you more. If you buy shorter contracts, they are cheaper, but you got to get it right. And you got to get it right that day because any wins, gains, or losses, at the end of the day, you got to eat it. Either you win or you lose that day. That's too much pressure for me. I'm not that kind of trader. That's why I stopped scalping because the pressure is on. You, you got to get it right. You got to get it right that day. And you've, you, you know, you got that six hour trading window and that's it. And if you are a good trader, if you're informed and you, you know, you've got all the pieces, that's great. Go for it. But for now, for me, and I would say this to new traders too, please start small, start in a paper account and give yourself time buy you know you can buy a contract that lasts seven days nine days i like those again a little pricier 
but it gives your trade time to breathe and time to work itself out. Yeah, I need the time. But if your money, if you have a very small account, let's say your account is under $1,000, you don't have $300 to, or you might not want to tie up $300 for seven days because there's, there are tons of other opportunities that are happening you know, in that seven days. So you might want to, if you have a small account, find a happy medium. Maybe you don't buy a seven day contract, you buy a three day contract. But again, you only have three days for that trade to work itself out. So it's up to you. Trading is very, you know, you'll learn your style. People who like to make their money quick, they're scalpers. I find like with scalpers, you have to be accurate. You got to be like, you better know, you better get it right. And I don't like that pressure of you better get it right. <laughs> mm -mm. Because too many times I've been close, but not absolutely on the money. And that extra day or two, just like this contract today, I purchased that three or four days ago and it didn't hit my price level like I thought it was going to no big deal. It hit it today. And we still make the profit. So that's my take on how to purchase, you know, a contract. Do you want a very short one? If you got a small con, you know, a small account, less than a thousand dollars, to be honest with you guys, you could trade with a $500 account. You really could. There are Ford contracts out there that you can buy for $50. You could trade all day and all night with a $50 contract from Ford, $150. So you don't have to be wealthy to do it. With that amount of investment, are you going to see a $400, $800 return? Probably not. But that's not the point. The point is to make your money grow. I would rather take $100 and at the end of the day have $125. I did that safely. I did that with very little risk. You know, a $100 risk is a whole different thing from a $5,000 risk. A $100 investment isn't going to keep me up at night. I'm not going to be stressing about whether or not Ford jumped up or didn't. I'm really basically learning when, when I'm trading forward, it's a very comfortable way for me to be in the market, potentially make some money, but it's low stress. So starting out, I definitely say paper trade for sure. Then you you know, you get $200,000 in your account. You can do whatever you want, but I, I advise that you do something realistic. If you are just itching to get in the game and you think you have enough skill, and many of you do, most of us do, to be honest with you. If we were trading together, you could totally trade forward and not be at too much risk. Um, I think Tar and I, me, Tar, when we were trading in PDC, I think we had a hundred dollars. The their accounts were very small accounts, and so again, a hundred dollar investment. You are sitting right there in front of your computer. If your account gets down $10 and you're uncomfortable, sell. You don't, you don't want to go. You don't want to give more than 10% of your money back. Sell it. Wait for another trading opportunity. We just saw two trading opportunities right here. One, two. You don't like this trade? Okay, sell it. Wait for this trade. Take this one. You don't like the way it's going? That's okay. Sell it before you lose any money. And one of the things that I heard Oliver Velez say is that you should know before going into any trade how much you are willing to lose in a day. And mine used to be $300, but I've gotten so much more conservative. I think I'm down to like $200. If I lose $200 in a day, it's time for me to close my computer and go home. Generally, um, the way I avoid that, again, is I swing trade. And so that price can do this, go up and down, up and down. But as it gets close to the expiration date, then I'm, I'm looking to manage and make sure that I don't, if it's not going my way, I don't want to lose too much. So 
that's it in a nutshell, y'all. Okay, we talked about candlesticks. We talked about the RSI. This kind of helps you discern, determine if the stock is oversold. And at the top, it's called overbought because that would be where the buyers have bought, 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 bought and run price up. The price cannot stay elevated like that. It may go up there, but it can't, it can't sustain. It would be just like if housing prices or car prices surged. You aren't going to be able to just surge out of control because what's going to happen? People aren't going to buy it. They can't afford it. They, nobody's prepared for car prices to shoot up $10,000. Cars will sit on the lot. You can't have a market like that. So this market is no different. We're selling things. People are actually selling equities. They're buying equities. It's no different than when if you were at a fruit market, if it's the housing market, price dictates itself. Nobody's going to buy QQQ. It's $700 a share. The market can't support it. That's why you'll see prices always hanging out around these simple moving averages, y'all. That's just common sense. So this is just kind of sitting here. You can see this. Oh, Lord, it's moving on. So if you were in this trade, this would have been a great place to get out, even on this candle. By the time you see this red candle, and certainly this second red candle, I would have been out of this trade. Again, here comes, this could very well potentially be another buying opportunity. Anybody who bought a contract here wouldn't be me because you have to come through all of these and there's no guarantee that this can't get caught up in here. It didn't, but there's no guarantee. I generally like to wait until a bar has cleared all of those. If it's trading beneath the 200, the 50, the nine and the 13, if it's trading beneath and these candlesticks are far away, oh, that's a go. That's a go for me. As it starts to move back over close, did you see that? Price will come away, but it's going to wake its way back over. It'll get away from them, but it's going to make its way back over because that's the average price. The price can neither drop too low because if it drops too low, guess what happens? If your cars go on sale and they're selling at under five, you know, $5,000 under the normal price, what are people going to do? They're going to go buy them. And once people start buying, the price is going to go up again because now there's a shortage. This is supply and demand, too. Can you guys see the relationship? This is nothing but supply and demand. When the price gets too high, people aren't going to buy. So that, that thing will sit there. So then price has to come down. If price comes down too low, here come the buyers. The buyers are going to buy it up because it's a bargain. And as they keep buying, the price keeps going up because now it's supply and demand. If there's not a lot of apples on the shelf and you buy them all and you know price keeps going, who would? I would be selling my apples for $5. It's only two apples on the shelf and everybody wants apples. You think I'm selling them to you for 30 cents? No, 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 because everybody wants them. So I'm going to shoot the price up. Supply and demand. I hope if you guys don't understand supply and demand that you will um, start to look in terms of these candlesticks representing supply and demand, and that's they correlate with price. Um, the only other thing that we really didn't really talk about is the lemon squeeze, but again, this is nothing but a color indicator. When price is going down, red, 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 you see it. When price starts to change, there's that crossover, it turns to yellow. When you're in an uptrend, it's this bright blue. When the trend starts to wane, it does this dark blue. Who, you know, who don't see that? I could teach that to a kindergartner. I could teach that to a third grader. Same with your RSI. Once it gets too oversold down here, it's got to go back up. Once price gets too oversold, um, too overbought up here, it's got to go back down. All day long, any equity is just doing that up and down, up and down, up and down. And if you look at it long enough, you'll start to see a pattern. You'll start to see, oh, it does this in the morning. It takes this many minutes for a price change of a dollar. Oh, it, I promise you, y'all, it's the easiest money in town, although there is risk involved. 
By easy, I mean you can understand it. Anybody can do this game. Anybody can get in and make money. Also, anybody can lose money if you're foolish or if you get in here when you're unprepared. Don't do that. Don't do it. I don't know anybody. There's some real experienced traders in our group and they drop in. You can tell the difference. Those experienced traders, they understand not just indicators, but they're into trend lines and all those other things. But for us, if you're like me, just starting out, I like to keep it simple. I understand down, sideways, up, down again, sideways. You know what this thing is going to do next. Once it finishes this red, this downtrend, it's going to go into an uptrend. I'm just looking for the strongest trend that is likely to produce the biggest change in price. And these big candles tell you, oh, that's a big change in price. You want these full body candles like that. You want them in that stair step pattern. You see that when one closes, another one opens and another one opens higher. We're looking for that. That's it. That's all. So let me turn the volume up so we can see what's happening in the news. And I'm going to take a break and grab some water and heat my coffee back up. Choose between them. We also introduced strategies designed to harness Let's see changes if we can get some CNBC going. CNBC is so funny. As long as oh, Powell is talking. being signed at relatively small increases. So we'll be watching very, very carefully, though, at at the larger service sector, which is 56%. Y'all better get ready because I don't know if anybody's trading, but whatever he's saying is going to affect this market. We'll We'll be watching that very carefully. Also, we raised rates very quickly last year. It may and we be know this. That, that might have been. I don't know when he started talking. Policy has delayed effects. Okay, I'm going to heat up my coffee. The full effects to be seen in economic activity and inflation. So we're, we're watching carefully to see those effects coming uh, into play. So we're And we're, we're aware that we haven't seen the...
and then drive hola. up unemployment. Hola, I gotta sister. tell you, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, these are maybe not the cheap seats. Uh, mm -hmm. But I actually think you've done a pretty good yeah, job. We're just listening to Chairman Powell. We caught him. Um, I had a push. And then this morning that I was able to get out of with a profit, I didn't see that big drop coming, but there was a big drop in price around 10 o'clock, um, which would have been nine o'clock my time. So I'm assuming that's when he started talking. And he must have said interest rates are going to continue to go up. And so the market res is responding to this conference. So that's why we are listening in on what he has to say, because it's going to affect price in the market. Mm -hmm. I'm going to also put this on the five minutes so I can see the pattern better. So, yeah, we went from the high of 304 yesterday down to 298. It got lower than that. Actually, it was down to 296. So $4 and then an additional. That was $8. That's an $8 drop from yesterday. Ooh, Lord, Lord, Lord. But that was good for us. This big red candle paid this morning. And then it, you know, gave some of it back. And now it looks like it's trying to decide what it's going to do. But we were able to capitalize on that big drop this morning and get out with a little profit. Yes. Oh, you all are watching? Yes, I'm watching it on CNBC. First one yeah, he's on Capitol debt. Hill now. It, it always affects, it's, you know, it's kind of there's always something in the price. There's always see, something. I just can't believe we caught it this morning, which was like sweet. Um, I'm going to even uh, go down whoever, to the three minute because of, I like to see what's concern, happening. You, you pointed to, um, see to, uh, I'm going to also uh, take a peek over here at this market watch. I've seen those come and go before. Generally, markets can absorb them. Just Maybe to a, see, a yeah. This time, you all see how red it is. Ooh. In terms of CRE, I would agree Let with you. Get the, rid the, of this stuff. The uh, occupancy of um, of office. I'm cleaning up my um. Major, uh, cities is just remarkably low. And chart. You, you wonder how that can be as over time. Clean up my watch list. Made into condominiums and things like that. Since we don't, we don't seem to have. Okay, so uh, let's see places. who's positive um, is, and who's negative today. So it's, it's Pepsi, Apple, QQQ, Spy, Tesla, Broadview, they're all negative. Do we have Google in here? We, I'm going to put Google. That's a, that's a, an area that Google is in Spy. And, um, I'm know, sorry, Google is a part case. of QQQ. So, well, that, well, Do we have well, Amazon in here? AMZN. About, okay. Uh, the large institutions of, I mean, yeah, I, Amazon I think, is uh, negative too. Critics, um, so everybody Frank, is. Our banking system is a ADM a is up. And Meta is up is slightly. Expand, um, uh, in a, Nvidia and Costco. Um, but what we've also seen. But most of the of things. This, let me go to the indices. A, a of, you know, QQQ runs neck and neck with the NASDAQ, and you can see it's all red. So that means we're down from yesterday. I just need to see how much further down we're going to go. The large entities. Yeah, prices down, 298. We'll see. That was a nice little hefty price drop there. We were able to capitalize on that. I'd like you to talk generally in the last 40 seconds or so of you know how you think about this regulatory perimeter I, i'm a big believer and i know some of my colleagues are that you know uh, that we ought to look less at charter and look at same risk same regulation maybe as a as a guiding principle and you know, uh, i know senator warren's been working on some work i've been working on some work around crypto around that that area but there's a, a vast amount of activity that's taking place outside the regulatory perimeter how should we be thinking about that and how do we make sure that doesn't create the kind of uh crisis sneak up that happened in 2008 on the non-regulated side of the house i think you articulated the principle very well it's same activity same regulation and that's that covers crypto and and all kinds of other activities People are going to assume when when they deal with something that looks like a money market fund that it has the same regulation as a money market fund or a bank deposit. And so stable coins need need some attention in that respect. Mm -hmm. I just think that's that's the basic principle. 
And you're right. So much of our uh, so much of intermediation has moved away from the regulated banks really for a long period of time. We got to keep an eye on that. We Thank you, Chair Powell. We can keep looking at. Thank you, Senator Haggerty of Tennessee. Thank you, Chairman Brown, and um, thank you very much, Ranking Member Scott, for holding this hearing. Chairman, it's great to see you again here. I appreciate your presence, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you about an item that I'm particularly concerned about, and that's the holistic <clears throat> review that uh, Senator Britt just brought up that um, Vice Chair Bauer is conducting right now. It's, it's generating a sense that higher capital requirements are on the horizon for us. And as I think about that in the context of what we've weathered, uh, you think about the, the, the situation uh, in 2020, it was an acute real life stress test, if you will. And I think that our financial system navigated that uh, admirably. Uh, in the past, Chair Powell, you told this committee that our financial system has proven resilient uh, through 2020 and that the capital levels at that point in time, and I, I would note that those capital levels are at multi-decade highs, are in aggregate adequate. And I just wanted to follow up on those prior statements and see if you still feel that way. So uh, I guess I would say it to you this way. We, uh, in our system, we have a vice chair for supervision who has statutory responsibilities. And when a new vice chair for supervision comes in, generally they're gonna wanna take a fresh look. That's what the former the one, you know, uh, vice chair Quarles did. And that's the, Dan Cerullo kind of had the job on, it, on an informal basis, and that's what he did. So it's only natural that someone would come in and, and take a fresh look, and I think that's, that's part of the process. The role of that person is to make recommendations on regulation and supervision, those when made. Mm -hmm. And this, to me, this just comes under, under that heading. Well, as, 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 it, uh, as the review is underway, and I appreciate that uh, context, one aspect of it seems to us as an apparent willingness to undo the tailoring requirements that were enacted as part of S2155. <clears throat> and I understand that nothing has been finalized. Uh-oh, uh what happened to our... Oh, we lost Chair Powell. I don't know if it's them or me, but I'm still here with you guys. I don't know, let's see. If it's the internet, I don't know. Hmm. We'll see. At any rate, we're just watching the price of QQQ. And I'm going to pull up Market Watch again just to show you the impact. So this Market Watch is a heat map. Oh, it's, it's, it's my um, Thinkorswim. It's frozen. So my Thinkorswim has frozen. I'm just going to let it sit. Sometimes it'll work itself out. So we're just listening to Chairman Powell give his, I think he does a quarterly speech. We're just listening to him, and um, everybody knows the drill. Interest rates are going to continue to go up. I did not expect that he was going to um, say anything like interest rates are going to go down. The man has not been saying that. Interest rates, they are where they are. And I think they're waiting for whatever they're waiting for in the, the economy to happen. It hasn't happened. So I wasn't surprised my mind said that price was probably going to be affected and that it, we would see a drop because nobody wants to hear about increasing interest rates. I heard someone in the news say the other day that we could see housing um, interest rates creep up to double digits. That hasn't happened in a very long time. Man, I brought my house 30 years ago and I, it wasn't double digits. I don't think I ever saw double digits during that time. At least I, you know, I didn't refinance or anything, but I don't know that the interest rates ever crept into double digits. I know they certainly went down because at the time when I bought my house almost 30 years ago, anything from 5% to 6%, that was a decent rate. I mean, you were happy to get, you know, 4%, 5%, that was good. So this is this is significant, you know. The, these interest rates uh, certainly affect how much house you can buy, and so all this stuff is tied in. So that's why we listen to what's happening in the world. Wars affect price. All these worldly events affect how markets trade. So that's why I listen. Um, if this thing doesn't straighten itself out, if it doesn't connect, let's see. I'm going to, nope, it's frozen. I'm going to go ahead and log out of my Thinkorswim and log back in. To be honest with you, it hasn't been doing that. I've got 
much better um, internet here. I haven't had really any problems like the problems I had in Playa, but you know, that place was way back, all concrete and closed. This place is what is open. So I have much better internet um, connectivity. Any problems that I'm having now is probably related to me, but this is just frozen. So let me go ahead. I'm going to take this. Um, I'll take the market screen out and I'll pop in some stuff maybe from our drive that we could go over. Oh, I want to see if I can show you guys this video. Um, let's see. Let me go back to our drive because there are some videos in the drive I want to show you. I, I hope it lets me go here because they definitely came up. And we could watch a really quick video on, um, on the Greeks. Let's see. While I, I hope this works. Oh, this is my girl. Let's see. Okay. Hold tight, sis. Let me see if I can put this back in and we can watch this together while I reboot my... Yay, I think we could do it. Okay, so share. You guys should be able to see this. I'm waiting to see if it pops up. Oh, yay. So we can watch Black Girl Stocks. Let me try this. This is all new for me, y'all. Incorporate something else. So I was able to um, drop these in the drive so you can see them. But we can share one now while I reboot my think or swim. Yeah, they don't even know this, these little interest rates. I'm like, y'all really these, I can remember double digits. Yes. Back in the day. So I get it. You know, my baby never saw this. She's looking to buy a house. Um, they, they don't know. So everybody's up in arms about this little 7% temp. What? I was happy to get 6%. Okay, so I'm going to play this for us. And this is Black Girl Stocks talking about the Greeks. Um, listen up. This option when the stock is going up. Fox Tale from the D. I'm logging out of my Think This One Couple Pro. Hey, what's up, YouTube? This is Foxtel Digital coming to you again with Black Girl Stocks. And in this video, we will be talking about the Greeks. All right, so what's up, YouTube? In today's video, we are going to be talking about the Greeks of options trading. You might be asking, well, Foxtel, what are the Greeks? I don't care about that. I don't have time for that, sis. Let's get to the options. Come on, what's up, what's up? Calls, puts. Okay, I understand, hold on. So, when you first start getting into options, you may have a few questions, concerns, or some terrible news. So just picture it. Let's say that you buy a call option contract, right? And it expires in about a month. So you buy this, you buy this contract, it expires in a month. The stock is in an uptrend and you know it's going up, but it's going up and down, up and down. But, sh but you know it's going to continue going up by the expiration date. And maybe you bought it with a strike price that is way further up from where the share price is right now. Okay. Coins are tight right now. And I know buying out of the money options are cheaper. So that's why you did it. The stock is going up and down, but it's two days from expiration and the stock is going up. But wait, my option value is going down. But like, what's going on? How is it that the stock price can go up, but my option is losing value? Foxtel, you didn't tell me it was going to be like this. The answer to that question, my friends, lies in the Greeks. So that's why today we're going to be talking about the Greeks, what they are, and how you can use them to help you along your option trading journey. So I've been talking about this for the past couple of weeks now, and this is the video. This is it. You've been waiting for this. If you're trading options, this is the video that you want to watch. I promise you that. My. But first, if this is your first time watching this video, 
please make sure that you click that thumbs up button. It really helps the channel. Also, make sure that you subscribe and click that notification bell so that you get notified anytime I upload a new video for you guys. What are the Greeks? I know you keep hearing them. I know if you've actually bought options on Robinhood or any other trading platform, I know you've seen the Greeks. I know you've seen them. You've probably wondered what they are. If, if you're not already familiar, I know that you guys have been curious. What are these weird little numbers down here? Do they mean anything? Yes, they do. It's your roadmap to success, to wealth. So basically the Greeks represent the makeup of the marketplace that tells you how your option contract is going to react to changes in different variables, different variables associated with the price. That can be different things like time to expiration, how close you are to the expiration date or time decay, the amount of volatility or change in the actual stock price, different things like that. But keep in mind, there's no guarantee that this is 100% all the money. This is all speculative. We're going to get into Robinhood and I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to pick a random stock. You guys know, I always pick Tesla I'm telling you, you guys, y'all are going to see me pulling up in a video in my Tesla. I still don't know what color I want. I'm going in between black and white. So I'm thinking about black, but you guys are definitely going to see me in a Tesla. I'm manifesting it. If you guys don't believe in manifestation and the secret, you're missing out. You got to pick that up. So we're in Robin Hood. Uh, I'll pick Disney. It's $148.40 a share right now. And so I'm just going to go ahead and get into some options. I mean, it's, let me see. Do I think it's going up? Yeah, it's definitely in an uptrend. All right. So trade options, December 4th, I think it's going up. So I'm going to do a call. So it's just going to be a basic call. And I'm going to show you where to find your Greeks. This is just in Robinhood. I can also, I can also show you how to find it in Weeble. So leave a comment below and let me know if you guys want to see it in Weeble. Let me know right now. I might do it in the video if you hurry up and leave a comment below like right now. All right, let me, let's just go. Let's just go. Um, I think it's going up by December 4th. Mm, let's just say it reaches 149. It goes up a little bit. So I'm going to click here and this is going to show me my stats. Bid, ask, volume, open interest, volatility, yada, yada, yada. Now, what we're interested in is down here at the bottom. This is the Greeks. I know you guys have seen it. This is what it is. So because the option price does not always move in sync with the actual stock price, it's really important for you guys to know what's actually contributing to that option contract's value and what effects they have. One thing I really want to clarify is that these numbers that you see here, the Greeks, they're strictly theoretical. I said that before. So different values that we use, like you see up here, you see the bid, the ask, the volume, open interest, those are all real values, real data, very measurable. But these Greeks, they're theoretical, they're calculated. So just keep it cute with them. Don't put all your faith in them. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Just be aware. Keep that in mind, okay? So let's continue. Okay, so the Greeks are going to be shown as sometimes very small or negative numbers. And basically what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to normalize them to dollars. So they're all the numbers that you see here, just multiply them by 100. And that's going to give you that value as pertained to the full contract of the 100 shares. So just multiply this by 100. So you see this 0. 0.42 delta, multiply that by 100 into the first term. Let's get into the meat and potatoes of it all. I want to keep this video cute and short. All right. So first, the first one we're going to start with is Delta. So when I first started getting into options trading, I remember I had an option contract and I was holding on to it for a while because I thought that the longer I held on to it, the more money I was going to get because the first day I got $60. The next day I got another 30. So I was like, okay, the more I hold on to it, the more money I'm going to get. Right. No, wrong, honey. <laughs> so I'm holding it. I have a couple of days until expiration and the stock is really starting to go up. Like it went up two or three dollars, but my option contract started losing value still. It wasn't going anywhere. I was like, what is going on? 
That's Delta. As I was holding on to it, my Delta was dropping. This is what Delta is. The Delta is the amount that an option price is expected to move based on $1 increase in the actual stock. So if the stock goes up $1, essentially you would be adding that Delta value to the price of your option contract. Um, on call contracts, the Delta is going to be positive number between zero and one. And on puts, it's going to be a negative number between zero and negative one. So remember that Delta is going to be positive for calls and it's going to be negative for puts. Okay. So here's an example. Let's say that you have a call option contract that's worth $3. All right. So $3 per share, whatever it's worth $3. You have a Delta. All right. And you have a Delta of 0.50. And theoretically, the stock is going to go up $1. So in theory, the price of that $3 call option contract is going to go up 50 cents if your Delta was 0.50. So the option is going to be worth 3.50 as opposed to $3. Okay. So if your stock went up $1, then you would essentially get $50 if your Delta was 0.50. On the other side, if the stock dropped a dollar, so if the underlying stock dropped a dollar, then your, <laughs> on the opposite side, if your stock dropped a dollar, then your option price would also drop that 50 cents. Okay. So your Delta was 0.50. So it would go from being worth $3 to $2 and 50 cents due to your Delta. And this is for a call. Now, if it was a put, it would essentially be the opposite, but just remember that a put is valuable when the stock falls and it's profitable when the stock rises. So it's really just a flip of the call. So just think about it like that. I hope this makes sense because it's really easy when you think about it. And one trick that a lot of people use for Delta is they use Delta as a probability of their option expiring in the money. So if you have a stock that has a Delta of 0.8, then a lot of people would say you have an 80% chance of this option expiring in the money and um, you'll be very profitable with it. So that's one way that you can use Delta also. So yeah, because of how important Delta is, a lot of traders are curious, okay, well, what changes Delta? Does Delta stay the same? And no, it doesn't. As you see, I know you guys have traded before and you see that your Delta sometimes will drop the longer you hold your stock or it might go up. So there's something else that fluctuates the value of Delta. And that's going to be the gamma, all right? So gamma is going to measure the rate of change in the delta for each change, for each dollar change in the underlying stock. So when the stock rises a dollar, whatever your gamma is, that is going to be added to your delta. So you're just making more money. It's really good if you know what you're doing. So let's say if you had a stock that has a delta of once again of 0.8 and you had a gamma of 0.2, if that stock rose $1, then not only would you get that 0.8, but you'd actually get that full $1 because that gamma will be added to your delta. So that's why you want to keep in mind looking at your delta and looking at your gamma. And think about it like this. Delta is like the speed that an option price changes, then the gamma is essentially the acceleration. How are we accelerating versus how fast we're going? Horsepower, baby. So options that have a high gamma are very responsive to price movement of the underlying stock. So that could be up or down. They're or, so that's why you wanna be right. You wanna be right in your prediction. Yeah. And unlike the delta, Gamma is going to be positive for calls and puts because you remember that with the delta, the calls are positives uh, for the delta. I don't even want to confuse you, but since we're talking about delta and gamma, I really just want to look at this uh, this chart right here. But you'll see a chart and you have your delta and your gamma over 60 days from expiration. And then you have the delta and gamma one day away from the expiration. And I just really want to show you how important these numbers are whether you're close to the expiration or not. So we have, look up here at the top, we have the stock price and it's going up $1. So we have it from 48 to 49, 50, 51, 52. So originally, uh, let's just start at the top. We have a Delta of 0.32 and then we have Gamma of 0.8. So that is gonna match up to 40. Uh, it's not just gonna be the 0.32 that we get when we rose up that dollar in the actual stock price. 
it actually turns up to 40 because of the gamma. And then let's go up here further. Uh, look here when the stock price was at 50. So our delta is 50, but our gamma is 0.10. It's, it's kind of high. So when the stock rises again, we don't just get 50. We actually get an extra 10.10. Uh, so it ends up being 0.60 instead of just that five. So this is what's showing you what happens when you have high gamma um, with a high delta. Let's go down here at the bottom. You see here we're one day away from expiration. So normally your delta is going to be a little bit lower, but let's just skip here where our delta. Oh, okay. Yeah. Our delta, our gamma is higher here. So let's say if we had a delta of 0 0.50, but we had a gamma of 0.4. So if the stock rolls a dollar, we're not just going to get that 0.5. We're actually going to get point. 90 because uh, our gamma is so high. So this is another reason why keeping track of the Greeks is really important. It's going to help you know whether or not you really want to stay in, in, in this option contract. So we've gotten past those delta, gamma, what's next? So the next thing that we're going to look at is how changes in time and volatility affect the option value as well. So we've already talked about two things. Now we're going on two more. Oh. We're going on two more oh. that are going to affect this options value. So the first one that I'm going to get into is theta. Theta or time decay is one of the biggest enemies to new option traders. And I can tell you that in the example I gave you about myself, my theta was so high, the longer I was holding on to it until expiration, because I thought that I was making more money, but I was actually losing money because my delta is dropping, gamma is dropping, my theta is going up. So let's get into the theta. So the theta represents the amount that you're calls and puts will decrease theoretically each day that you hold on to this option contract. So if you have a theta of 0 0.10, multiply that by 100. Each day that you hold this contract, you're losing, isn't that what, $10? Every day you're holding this contract is losing $10 in value. That's basically what's that, what that's saying. So if you have a high theta, mm, I don't know, sis, it might be time to get out. You do what you want though. So the only time I like having a high theta but the only time I care about my theta being high is when I'm doing my credit spreads and you know I love to do a cute credit spread when she's using Tidlio <laughs> I love to use Tidlio to use credit spreads and I love to have a high theta because that means that it's just losing more and more value for the other person and I'm just getting all that coin so thank you Tidlio and thank you theta all right, that's enough. That's enough product placement for you, Sabe. Ugh. All right, so one way that you can think about theta with option trading is think about leaving a piece of ice in the hot sun. All right, so the longer time decay and time value of that piece of ice being in the sun increases the melting of the ice. So think about time decay the same way. The longer you hold on to that option, the longer that piece of ice is just suffering in the sun, it's melting, it's losing its essence. That's what high theta is. Hot sun, high heat, high theta. And so a rule of thumb about theta, so as a rule of thumb for theta, option contracts with strike price that are at the money have a higher time value. So I feel like because it's right now, like I'm right here, the time value is higher. I'm in the moment, you know, it's happening right now. And the last Greek that we're going to talk about, not to be confused with volatility, and the Vega represents how the option, con how the options value is going to change with the change in the stock's volatility. So. If we go back here in Robinhood and you see how we have the implied volatility, you see that percentage, right? So it'll let you know the stock's volatility and however much that volatility changes. All right. So just think about it like this with the implied volatility, the Vega is just an estimate of how the value of an option is going to change when the volatility changes by 1%. You just want to keep an eye on your volatility 
You want to keep an eye on all of them, actually. And there's one more that I really didn't mention uh, down here on Robinhood. It's the row. And uh, row basically just means how much your option contract is going to change in value for each 1% change in interest rate. So I just know just one thing to remember about, about row. If you're doing a short term contract, like let's say if it's a month or something away of your expiration, then our row isn't really going to affect you that much. But if you're doing something long term, maybe six six months or a year or something in advance, then this could be critical for you with your interest rate. So if you're doing things far in advance, long-term holding with contracts, do some more research on your row, but I'm not going to do that research in this particular video. Uh, you know, honestly, that video was quicker than I thought it was going to be. I mean, it's really not that much. Honestly, I told you guys it, it's not that bad. It's just a few different, you know, a few different theories, um, you know, keeping in mind, let's just look at this Disney. All right. But this is just with an expiration date of December 4th. So let's say if we moved it further out till February 20 or February 19th, then let's look at our options. Okay. So the Delta is, you know, it's kind of low 0.49. Your theta is very low though. It's 0 0.05. So you still have time for your Delta and your Gamma to increase. Because your theta is so low, you're not going to be losing it as long as the stock is in the uptrend. Then you'll be good, my friend. You'll be good, friend. Hey, friend. But yeah, that's all I really wanted to say about that. Um, if you guys want me to show you how to get to options in Weeble, I'll do that. So let's go over here to Weeble and we'll start with that. Disney. All right. So I'm on Disney here. And the way I would get to the options there is I'll just click trade. And you see here, on here on the bottom, you see buy, open orders, my positions, options. Click the options, all right? And you click the options. You guys, I don't think we need to look at that part because she's going to show you how to trade on Robinhood. And I just would not recommend Robinhood for trading, like for real, for real. No, nope. it's just not enough support. There are so many better platforms than Robinhood. I even think Webold is better than Robinhood, but I don't like them. It's too game-like. I think it, no... Nah, I need all the support. I think I like Thinkorswim best because it has everything built in. I haven't used TradingView. I did look at Fidelity's platform, and I forgot the name of it. That's sad, but I forgot the name of it. Um, it's just not enough support <coughs> on Robinhood. I think it also encourages you to trade like on the go, on your phone with, with little information. It's almost like, I don't know. I think you, you mm -mm. more novice traders that are just young people. I think it's a money grab. I think that's an easy way to get little bits of money from people who are inexperienced. That was me. I used to trade on Robinhood when I first started. Y'all didn't know. Oh my God. When I think about it, when I think back, I was trading without the benefit of a chart. I would just look at it and say, okay, I see what I think is going to go up. Oh my God. I made some money, but you know, not the way you should be handling your finances. We are talking about real money that you work for. No, 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 no. So definitely I'm an advocate for being educated, being informed, taking your time, learning all the tricks of the trade before you place a trade. I, I, little, I literally did that. And Robinhood almost encourages you to do that. They give you this little diagram that shows the price action over time. And so you, I would look at it and be like, okay, price is going up. I think it's going to go up today. Oh, Lord. And place a trade. <laughs> yes. It's like gambling. Yes. I, it was basic. It was just shy of gambling because I had, I didn't know where price was, you know, relative to anything. It's so sad. So don't do that. Don't do that. There is a way to invest. There is a way to trade. And I promise you, it, you have to have some respect for this game. I learned that. I am very respectful now. I don't jump in. When I don't know something, I admit I don't know that. And then I don't do it. That's why you don't see me jumping around from, you know, like trading Apple one day and Tesla and then this. 
Number one, you I haven't done the research on those. I don't know all the price levels for all of those stocks. And so it would be foolish of me to go in in the morning and one day trade Tesla. And then the next day I'm going to go trade. I mean, you could, you could see it, but I wouldn't recommend that. I think you need to know price levels. You need to know what the price has done. You need to know where it gets stuck and, and you just need to know the history. And if you're not going to do that work, like go in and plot, support and resistance and look at what the high of the day was before. If you're not going to do that, you shouldn't be investing in that thing. That's why I do one thing. I stick to it. I study that one at night. I study that one in the morning because I'm only, that's what I know I can do. If I threw in three or four more, what would happen is I would probably do a little bit with each one. And I just don't know. I don't know. I don't do it that way. But you know, you're free to do it any way you like, but that's not how I do it. I want to give myself the best chance to be successful. And y'all, I had some pretty decent trading days. You have to be focused too. Um, if you want to be successful at trading, yes, you have to learn. You have to educate yourself on a ticker. Can you do two or three? Yes. But I would say you better really put in the time you need to know the history of that stock. You need to know the average true range. There's so much you need to know if you want to give yourself the best chance to be profitable. And for me, it's focus. I have to focus on this one thing. I understand how it moves. And so let's look at, yeah, I'm going to bring QQQ, bring the chart back in because it hasn't been doing anything but consolidating since. So let me show you. And we can talk about, you guys know what consolidation looks like, but here it is. So when I say consolidating, what I mean is you can look right here. This price hasn't done anything. It's just right here. It's not going up. It's not going down. It's trading in this little tight range on the top of the very tippy top, 298.50. At the very bottom, 297. We could say 297.50. So it's trading in this little $1 range right here. No. So we don't fool with that. And you can also see that it's entangled. Whenever it's tangled up in the moving averages, no. We you can make money. This is look, look at this. When it's away from that thing. When it's away from there, that's money making time. When it, even this little bit cutting through and away, that's money making time. This is not necessarily money making time. This is, let's sit and see. You can also look at the RSI. I love this because it's so predictable, you all. Look at the RSI. The RSI value is 45. That's right in the middle. 30 would be overbought. No, no, I'm sorry. Oversold. I always do that. And 70 would be oversold. Oh, the banner's blocking. Say no mas. Okay. Thank you, Marilyn. Yeah. Okay. So you guys can see that. Um, look at the RSI. You see how it's just sitting right there, literally in the middle. Nothing's happening. But I will tell you this, and this is just simple layman's term. This is anything technical, technical trading talk. Generally, when that thing is sitting like that, at some point, there could be a breakout and it'll either break up to the top or it'll break down and price will go down. I live for that because it's not going to sit there. Although I have seen it consolidate all day. There was a day like that not too long ago where price just didn't do anything. It just kind of sat in the middle, chopped a little in the morning and then sat. But you see what I'm saying? Look at this big red candle coming in. And you see how the RSI is taking a, a dip? I'm going to be curious to see what my MACD shows and what my lemon squeeze shows. This could potentially, if we this candle closes and then we get another red candle and they close beneath all of these, that could be potentially, you know, a, a put play. But I'd have to see more. But it, I like this because it is trading beneath. Look at this red candle coming in. I'm going to switch it to the two minute just so we can see. And I'm not going to trade anymore today. So we can look at this 
in real time together. Um, too big. Let's make it smaller. Okay. So you can see this, this price is just hanging out underneath. It's like it can't get above this 297. See, I would call that 297.50. Even though it said 297.65, I've noticed that QQQ at the dollar mark and at the 50 cent mark, it's generally something happens. You'll notice. Just watch it. If it's consolidating, if it gets stuck, like... It can't get above. Generally, that's around the dollar mark or the 50 cents mark. And right now, she's just consolidating here and kind of stuck right under these simple moving averages. The price can't seem to get above, to not much above $297.50. It hasn't gone much lower than, let's get this over here. It hasn't gone much lower than... 297.29. It's just trading in this little range. So you want to know price levels. Like, look at this. You see how all these candles clustered here? Right here. Look at that. That's two nine around 297 even. So pay attention. I'm not sure if all of the equities have those as price levels, but I know for a fact QQQ gets stuck, you know, gets stuck there. And so now we're at 297.90. So this, look at the RSI start to turn up. We got this big green candle. This is the 9, the 13, and the 50. If it goes above that, cuts through that 50, look at that green candle coming in. And we can see down here, look at the MACD. These bars are starting to get taller. These are starting to spread apart. Soon we should see the next color we should see if this trend continues, we should see some blue come into our lemon squeeze down here at the bottom. It's just, I promise y'all, if we can master that, just being confident that we can read this and understand when that RSI goes up, for me, when that RSI is right in the middle, you know it's either going to go to the top or it's going to go to the bottom. So you're just looking for an entry. If another green candle comes in like this with no wicks, like this one closes and another one comes in, hey, what's stopping us? That might, yeah. So let's see. So far, we went from 297.50 all the way up to 298.30, you all. That's almost a dollar. No wicks. I love it when there aren't any wicks. That tells me that they aren't fighting. This is pure. These are buyers in here. Buyers, buyers, buyers. If another green candle in the next two minutes opens, like you see where this one closed, this one opens, that's a good sign. We're, let's see, this, we got some wicking here. And that wicking tells me that sellers are present. And so those wicks are indicators that I always pay attention when I see a lot of wicking because that's opposition. Yeah, look at them. They're pushing the price down. You see how the price is coming down with that? The longer that wick is, 298.18. Let's see, they're fighting because sellers want to push the price up. I'm sorry, buyers want to, buyers push the price up. Sellers push the price down. I wasn't surprised to see that red. You see, they push the price down. When I see wicking like that, I'm not surprised if I see a candle that comes in the opposite color or if you see a small one like that because there's this fight going on. It's not a clear winner. These are clear winners. That's a clear winner. That big old candle, you know, this red, come on. But when they're tiny like this, yeah, it's something going on. They're fighting. They're duking it out over this price. But still, it's still going up. So we just want to look at that. You look at the size of the candle. You look at the shape of the candle, the wicking. All of that is information that helps us kind of figure out what's going on with the price. Yay. Thank you guys for liking and um, sharing and subscribing and all that good stuff. I sure appreciate it. The channel is growing beyond what I thought, you guys. I, I can't believe that there's so many women and not... A, I also looked at our analytics. 
the audience is getting younger. Really what it is, is everybody. Men are watching. Half the, when we first started out, I think 90% of the audience, it was all women, literally. It was. It was 90% women. It was 90% women in my age group. It was us. It was all my Exodus sisters. That's all. It was, it was just us. Now the audience is half and half. The audience is, I want to say it's like 53% women and 47% men, which was shocking. We even have a demographic between 18 and 24. So it tells me that everybody wants to, there are people who want to learn the skill and not necessarily have to do it in a formal way. Just they want to see people drop in. And that's the, that seems to be the format that works. When we're on, people drop in and drop out. They come, they stay for a while, they pop in, they pop out. It's, it works. It's working because we just keep adding more subscribers. So thank you. If you like, subscribe and share, thank you even more. Because if you want the information, it's all free. And you know, I'm all about sharing a free resource. So when I tell you all, go subscribe to Chris Sane. I like Chris Sane. I know people who say it's a little light, but I like what I like about Chris Sane is he gives you price levels. He talks you through the play. He's giving it away. If you want to try that in your paper account, that's perfect. Because I'm not the best at understanding um, price levels for different equities. Like I couldn't tell you what the price levels were for Apple or Tesla or Microsoft, but he does. He tells you, watch it. When it gets to this price, we purchase a call. When it gets to this price, we're purchasing a put. That's helpful for a new trader. So you all see QQQ creeping up. That is a, that's a good sign. Those one, two, three, it's not too wicky, not too many wicks happening. The RSI is not overbought yet. It's at 57. You don't, you know, it's not overbought till you get up to 70. Look at this brighter, brighter, taller. You see these very far apart. And here I told you, here comes this blue. That's all we're looking for, not rocket science. You want to see these little stair steps where this one closes, this one opens. Where this one closes, this one opens. Price is just stepping up gradually. That's a beautiful thing. Look at the nice tall volume. That's lots of buyers are in there. They're buying it. Look at this next one. This is, yay, two and above all of these. Oh yeah, if I was trading, I would be looking at this. Because now we've cleared all of these. We don't have anything to worry about. What's stopping us? Unless there's a price level here, but we're right at $300. So I think potentially this trade could go on before you see some real resistance. At, that's $300. You're at $298.57. That's a dollar fifty cent. You can make some money on a dollar fifty cent. Don't let nobody tell you you cannot. You can make money on a dollar fifty cent move. So, of course, I'm looking at the shape of the candles to see, are they going to stay red? You're, I'm green. You're looking at your RSI. Is it trending up? Is it? You don't even have to look at it. The value is right over here. Did you see that? It went up to 58.77. So you want to watch your RSI value. I'm watching the color and the size. You see that turn dark green? You see that turn red? You, you can see. All those indicators work together to, to make this simple to see. So before I would start trading, I would just study this stuff, which is what I did for months. I just looked. It's like, mm. oh, so that's what happens when this happens. That's it. That's trading to me. It's looking at patterns, looking at relationships, studying your indicators. I know people who trade, they don't use indicators. They only use candlesticks and volume. You can tell if the volume is going down really, really low. You can tell that those candles are really, really tiny, that the trend is changing. But I do like the benefit of my RSI. It helps me with entry. It helps me know, is this a good place to enter? And generally, the closer to these lines, those are good entries. If it's way down here, you know the price has to go up. So you would. Pro it's a better 
place to enter a call if your RSI is way down here. If you are, and I used to do this, y'all, I did all the dumb things. And I won't even say the dumb things. I did all the rookie things. I have purchased a call up here. Insane. Insane. That's not, that's not a good place. That's not a good place to purchase a call. That's a great place, however, if your RSI is all the way up here. And so that's a great place to consider at least one of the factors for considering buying a put. Because event, if that price thing is way up here, it's coming down. This is nothing but common sense, y'all. It's common sense and skills. You can be taught a skill. And the skill is how to read the chart, how to know what, what makes a good entry, and when to get out of that joint. That's all you need to know. Watch these relationships. Red candles coming in. Look at the Volume, look at the RSI going down. Look at that turning dark green. I would expect that sooner or later we're going to see a dark blue. That's the that's just the the flow of it. They get bigger, bigger, bigger. They're this light blue. When the trend change, they're gonna turn dark blue and they're gonna get smaller. It repeats itself, y'all. Every day, the market does this same thing over and over again. So that's why I said study, study one thing. Yeah, we love Chris saying he retired at 39. Wow. Mm, I love him. He makes it simple. I like anybody who can, I can listen to them and say, oh, I get it. Oh my gosh, I get it. There are some folks that I have listened to. I, I can't follow them because they, you know who I can't listen to? He's a momentum trader. I just feel like all he does all day is try to impress you with what he knows. I got to, I don't use him either. Ooh, it's, I think it's warrior trader. He's a momentum trader, but it's fast. I don't know. It just doesn't suit my learning style. Yes, Linda, I took modern black girl. It was a class. I took it about six months ago and the price is constantly changing. So check them out. Um, there's another one. And, and let me say this, I'm not, I don't advocate and I'm not pushing anybody's trading program. That's the one I took. There are others out there too. There are tons of them. Do some research, do some research on, you know, which one. Um, and I would say this before you plunk down any money, before you plunk down any money, get on the platform, find out what platform they teach from and learn the platform first. Because if you don't, what you, I hope this doesn't happen to you, but this is what happened to me. They would be telling you, you know, like, here's how you do your watch list, or this is how you um, put your indicators on. I didn't know where the heck that stuff was on the platform. I'm like, wait a minute. And trying to do it, trying to learn it and do it at the same time is not a good mix. It's just not a good mix. Learn the platform first. Find out if you want to go with travel and trade or stocks and stilettos, whoever you want to take a class with, I would say, find out, do they use TradingView? Do they use Thinkorswim? And I can't, why can't I call Fidelity's trading platform? Dang it. I have it loaded, but I don't use it. Um, learn practice. Learn how to get in and out of an order. It doesn't matter if you, you know, in paper trading, it don't matter if you make money or you don't. But at least if you, when they say go over here and, you know, add to your watch list, you already did that. That's no learning for you. It won't get in the way of following along. I couldn't follow along with them because I was so busy trying to figure out, well, wait a minute, where is that? What did she say? How do I do that? Hold on. The class doesn't stop for you. The only reprieve I had was I would have to rewatch that class over and over. Pause and stop. Pause and stop. Pause and stop. That's good, but that's not ideal. What's better is if you have all that teachers call that front loading. That's like before I ever would teach a kid about how to divide fractions vocabulary, 
I would have even given them some hands-on practical things that they could touch and see and do and manipulate first. So that now when I start giving them this like rapid fire, like when I start the lesson, they're not asking me, well, what does that mean? How do we, how do we get there? You don't want to, you don't want to do that. You don't want to teach vocabulary and platforms at the same time you're trying to teach a technique. It's, it's too much for a new learner. So just as an experienced teacher, there's some value in practicing first with something so that the computer doesn't stand in the way of you listening. Because, I mean, they were teaching. I'm sure it was good stuff. But I, this was me. Like, oh, Lord, where is that? What did she say? How do I find that? Did I hit the right one? She's a moved on to another topic. I'm still trying to follow along. Mm-mm. Mm -mm. learn the vocabulary, learn what puts are, learn the options chain, understand how to put in an order, understand what candlesticks mean. It's not hard. And don't let anybody make you feel like it's too hard for you to learn. It is not. You are not too old to learn it. You are not too young. You didn't have to be an honor student. You could have rolled, you know, you could have been in the other class off to the side. Any of that. It's all a lie. Yes. I'm a, I'm a kinesthetic learner. You can't just talk to me. You can. And my, my mind, I'll be going, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And as soon as you walk away, I lost it. It's like, what did she say? So for me, I have to hear it. I have to write it. That helps me. I have to actually do it. I have to do an example. Yeah, everybody that is smart, everybody that is knowledgeable, that doesn't mean that you understand how knowledge is made or how meaning is made. And I'm telling you, you have to fill in those blanks for people. You need pillars. You need a base. You need a working knowledge before. And so if you've already been frustrated, don't worry. It wasn't you. It wasn't you because I did. I left that class no, I kind of knew. I knew it wasn't me, but I did feel like it was like, this is for the fast people. This is for the people who can catch on real quick. You sit over here. We'll get back to you in a minute for all those people who need. No, sweet. No, sweetie. That wasn't the problem. The problem was you don't understand that a new concept, nobody should be trying to make meaning, incorporate new learning, all of that at once. Nobody, and particularly the older we get, it does take time to process, but that doesn't mean you're dumb, you're slow, or you're stupid. It simply means you're, you're processing appropriately for your age and your knowledge level. That's what that means. So don't let anybody make you feel like you cannot learn this. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And there's so many resources out there. Please go to the community tab. Y'all see this thing cutting up. Look at these. Look, one, two, three, four, two, four, six, eight minutes of up. Look at the bright green. The color patterns are the same. That's what I want you to focus on, too. These indicators, it's the same. These patterns don't do anything but repeat themselves over and over and over again. Anybody who has sat with me or visited us here, you're going to see the same thing. When this thing is stepping down like this, this is beautiful. Price went from a high of 298 all the way down. To, what was it? 298, say 298.50, all the way down to 297.50. It'll run that dollar up and down all day. I don't know. You have to kind of get in early for a dollar run, but a nice $2 run. If that price changes in $2, you could potentially make a profit. You have to get in. You got to get out on time. But QQQ does this all day long. Let's look at it on the five minutes. I like looking on anywhere from there. Yeah. Because you can really, really start to see. All she's doing is up and down, up and down. You want a nice long run, though, a trend. These are, these are short, you know, spurts. You want a nice long running trend. Let me see if I can find a nice one that I, I think a nice, a beginning trader could make some money on this right here. 
You all see this? Here was the high of 304. And all that was a little consolidation. But once she got to dropping all these red candles together, now we're trading underneath all of these. Well, here's our 200 down here. And then down some more, consolidate and down and down all the way out the door, y'all. From 303 all the way down to $300. $3 drop. You don't even have to be smart. I swear you don't. You just need to know when to get in and at the end of the day, when to get out. At the end of that, that's a nice little downtrend. And I think if we look at it on the 15 minute, you'll really see it. That was yesterday. Oh, God, yes, it was a beautiful day. Can you see in the morning it went up? I'm going to make it even bigger so you guys can see. Here it is. This is 15 minutes. So two of these, that's a, four of these is an hour, one hour, two hours of price just going up. That's a nice, slow money making trade. You don't have to be anxious about that. And then look at this. All afternoon, price just kept falling. This was so beautiful. Price just kept falling, 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 falling. This is very different from a scalp. This is a great day trade here because you got time for it to just fall. It's falling slowly. It's making money. It fell a nice distance too. That's it. We're going we gonna to buy a call, catch it going up, let it consolidate. You can get out, go have some coffee, do whatever it is you need to do. Get a put, watch it go down, and sell it at the end of the day. That's how traders make money. In and out. You don't want to be there very long. You, you ain't here for a long time. We just here for a good time. We just want to have a good time, get some money, and get out. We don't want to be, if you don't have to be, you don't want to be in a swing, really. I told y'all, I swing trade, which is I hold them overnight if I don't get the move right that day. That's the only reason. Because if I get it right the day, I'm out. I'll, I don't stay longer than I have to. Don't overstay in a trade. It's no bueno. Because the longer you leave your money out there, the longer it is at risk. So it's riskier. It's less risky to have your money in the market for 30 minutes. Because what the heck could go wrong in 30 minutes? Not a lot of things can go wrong. Can something go wrong in 30 minutes? Yes. As opposed to a nine-day trade, can a lot go a lot of stuff could go wrong in nine days. So ideally, you do want to be right at the precipice of the move, like right when it's gonna happen. You want the move to happen, you want to get out of there. Does it always happen like that? No, with new traders, especially, it doesn't because sometimes we don't get it right. We know that it's coming. That's me. I'm, I'm listening to the news. I know that we're expecting or we're in a downtrend, but do I always, is my entry always spot on? Not so much. In the beginning, my entries were horrible because I would enter anywhere. I would chase a trade. Oh Lord. I would just jump in anywhere. I didn't care where the RSI was. I didn't care what any of those indicators were saying. I, I just saw movement and I would jump. Mm-mm. No, 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 no. You want to be selective about the trades that you're entering. And so we do that by watching what all this stuff says, and we only take good trades. You want to watch the simple moving averages. For me, for a put, I like to see that it's trading beneath, you know, my SMAs. For a call, if that thing is above my SMAs, that's good. Those are good indicators. I like to look at my RSI. Where is it? Like now this RSI is really low. So, and you can see that this downtrend is coming to an end. What's going to come after the downtrend, you guys? A uptrend. This thing is, is just going to go up and down all day. Up and down. So let's take it back down to our five minute and see if we can see it. So here you can see this over time. Down, up. It stayed up. Then it came down, up, and look at it, down. That was that down day, and then back up. That's it. We make money when it goes up to down, and when we're down here at the bottom, you want to enter when it goes up. That's when you, and you get out. You get in here, get out here. You get in here, you get out there. 
it, it is that simple. Once I saw that, it made sense. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. This, it just demystified the whole thing for me. And if you are in search of a great teacher, I promise you, and I'm talking about real trading, not the technical analysis piece. I'm talking about the trading technique and trading, you know, the actual trading. Check out Chris Sane. He doesn't do a lot of talking about technical analysis. He really talks about here's the trade you should take. This is when you're getting in. This is when you're getting out. This is the price level. This is the time frame. He is good for that. I like um, Oliver Velez. Oliver is pretty much the same way. He isn't going to be in there breaking down candlesticks and what they mean and what he isn't. That's he's not a technical analysis teacher. That's not what he does. He talks big picture. You know how what should you do before the market opens? Um, what are patterns, identifiable patterns? He's got great, 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 great content. And I'm so glad I discovered him. Um, somebody told me about him because he wasn't a part of my cognition. But now he is. And I watch all of his stuff. That's He is now the guru for me. Because I think I'm past the technical analysis piece in terms of, I understand what those candlesticks are saying. I understand what my indicators are doing. I got that. If you need technical analysis help, like what is a candlestick? What is this indicator? Rainer Teo is so good for that. And Black Girl Stocks. If you go back, she breaks down everything. I just adore her channel. She is a good mix because on Sunday, yeah, Oliver Velez. Yep, that's him. That's that's him. Mm-hmm. That's my boyfriend. <laughs> that's my new boo. That's my new boo. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He's good. His, I would say this. If I had to say one thing, I would I wish his videos were a little bit shorter because my ADHD kicks in about minute 15. You lost me. I, yeah, I think a good video teaching time. And you all, that comes from being a teacher. I promise y'all. As a teacher, I understand people's attention span is too much. After 20 minutes of, you know, introducing anything, every brain needs a reprieve. At some point, you get to the place of diminishing return. You bombarded people with too much. That's why I take a break. It's like, okay, y'all got some questions? Yes. <laughs> you go tell, tell him, please tell him. I said, Hey, call me. <laughs> I don't know. I think he is in Columbia. I think that's where he is. Um, which is so cool. So accessible. Yes. But watch him. He's great. Simple talk, good information. You know, I love his videos. You can watch one video and just feel smarter. Um, Chris Sane is more for people who are actually trading in real time. Like he's going to tell you what to buy tomorrow. He's going to tell you what price level to look for. That's very different from a Rainer Teo. He Rainer Teo, I have never heard him give levels and what to buy calls and puts in place. He doesn't give you a play. He is very much a basics. He teaches basics. Please do yourself a favor. Anything Rainer Teo puts out, watch it. If you're just starting out and you want to understand, if you want to understand um, how to read a chart, if you want to understand indicators, that's like the basics of technical analysis. That's a whole science in itself. And then those people, those other traders or other YouTubers or teachers, period, that share, some people share plays. That's another thing. Technical analysis is how to read the chart, all of that. What is this indicator showing? How to read it? Do you need it? How they work together? Some people will actually, like Chris saying, I would consider someone who is your day-to-day. -day. You want to see him because as a new trader, I need that support. It helps me say, oh, okay, yeah, I can go back to my chart, plot my own support and resistance and see if it, you know, correlates. Now I know. Oh, okay. And then I I, I want to say my new boyfriend, he is probably somewhere in between 
because I haven't heard him call out a play. He doesn't tell you like, okay, on Tuesday, be expecting the market to do this. But he has good practical trading wisdom. That's what I kind of see him as. Yes, Chris gives tips almost daily. You, you, they're two different. I just gave you three good YouTubers, three different things. Technical analysis, you just getting started. You don't even know what a candlestick is. Go see Rainer Teo. You already understand how to read charts. You already understand equities and price action and all that stuff and levels. Go see Chris Sane. Chris Sane is going to tell you exactly how to get in. He's going to tell you what to buy, when to buy, when to get out. If you are, you've got a good base. You know how the platform works. You've already been working with Thinkorswim or whatever your platform is. You understand some technical analysis. Now you need the pieces to come together. Go see Oliver Velez. Man, he has helped me make so much meaning, just practical things like zones. And, and oh my God, I watched a video. I think I posted it too on the community tab. Four or five things you should do in the morning. See, Chris Sane might not give you that. Chris Sane going straight for it. And Rainer Teo probably, that's not his thing either. He's got a theme. But Oliver Velez, real practical. He has traded for, I can't tell you how many years he traded on Wall Street. He trades, you know, for himself. Now he trains traders. He's going to tell you the practical things. You know, you know, you go to the Cordon Bleu to learn how to cook, and then you get in the kitchen with your grandma, and she show you how to make biscuits for real, like the real way. She don't even use a recipe. Two different, both valuable. You need that basic. You know, why does why does why do biscuits need baking powder? You know, what's the point of a leavening agent? What what's the effect of temperature? You know, if you turn it up this high, that's your technical cord on blue kind of learning. Grandmama don't know none of that. My grandma, no, she don't know none of that, but she make the best biscuits in the whole wide world because she's got tacit knowledge. She's been, she don't know why the heat, she does not even care. She don't care. She don't know why the baking powder makes the fly. She doesn't know. She doesn't have to know because she's got practical hands-on knowledge. And that's how I see kind of Rainer Teo is that technical dude that's going, he's your cord on blue. And I see Chris Sane and Oliver Velez, more like grandmama. They've been in the kitchen doing bacon biscuits all the time. They cannot tell you, or they probably know, but they are going to give you those practical tips. Like don't put butter on your bottom of your pan. Use Crisco because butter will burn. You know, that kind of stuff. Don't, don't put this kind of, don't put syrup on your bunny. Put honey on your bunny. That, that. So you need it all. Yeah, I appreciate you guys. So let's go back over here. I'm just going to pull QQQ back in so we can see what she's doing, which is nothing. I'm going to break it down to the two minute. Yeah, we don't want to be in this. You see that choppy choppy? Nope. If you caught this morning move, this, if you caught that, good for you. This consolidation choppy here, nobody wants to be in that. This little run up, run down, eh. And then we're back to consolidating. And you can tell consolidation too by looking at your RSI. It's sitting somewhere in the middle. It's sitting around that 40, 50 value. Because think about it, 20 up, if it's somewhere between 40 and 50, that's a mid value, 46. Because 50 is right in, it's 20 down from 70 and it's 20 up from 30. When that RSI is sitting right there in the middle, this is probably some consolidation. We want to see these big old sweeping, whew, that drop. We want to see this from bottom all the way to the top. That's how your RSI can help you. When you see it doing this, stay put. It's not a lot. Just wait, though, because generally when it consolidates for a long time like that, something's coming. I want to see if I can find one because that happened yesterday. It consolidated for a long time. And then we got this little pop off. Let's see if I can find it. I don't know. I don't know that. Well, I saw one. It just depends too on the, the um, time frame. Let's see if we can see it better on the five minute. 
Mm, I was trying to show you like the up and down and then consolidating. Would this be one of those days? Yeah. Yeah, this is a good one, more or less. You can see from the bottom to the top. That's a nice little run up. 288 went up to that was $2. $2 and some change. Then you can see, you see how it's just kind of sitting there? Look at this. Just kind of sitting there. It does spike up a little, but it's not doing much. We want these bottom to top, top to bottom. That is, that's what we're looking for. Those are the easiest trades. So I would be considered a trend trader. I'm always looking for the trend. And by that, I mean an uptrend, downtrend. There are other people who are more skilled and they know how to trade a range. Oh, so those would be like straddle plays, butterflies, iron condors, and all those other things. Right now, I do simple plays. Is it going up? Is it going down? That's all I'm concerned with. And is it going up and down quickly? Because you want it fast. Ideally, you want to be in and out of that trade. You don't want your money hanging out in the street too long. I would rather take a really good 20-minute trade, 30-minute trade, as opposed to swinging. I only swing when it doesn't go my way. If that trade goes my way, I'm in and out. Just think about it. The longer you leave your money in the market, the, the more it is exposed to something happening, some jump, and you just don't want that. So that's a part of risk management too, how long you leave your money out there and how much you leave it. Okay, let me get that out of there. Did that help you guys? Sorry about that. Yep, y'all have to tell me when it's blocking. I sure wish we could talk some way. They need to come up with a voice module to this thing. They really do. Because if I could hear you guys, that would be so great. I bet you a dollar they're going to come up with something in a bit. Okay, so let me go ahead, put the news back on and see how. Uh oh, did you all see that big jump? He's still talking. They, they that related to things like seasonal adjustments or or uh, a warm January, but nonetheless, they all point in the same direction. And
I'm, a, I'm a sorry, y'all. And, and, if know, I take Steve, myself out, I, I guess you I had forgot. to figure that the chair was going to be my more self hawkish off. today. That was the risk. This I guess, is how going I can in. take myself out it's without taking out the that sound. What Bill LeBeau reported earlier about used car prices Can't and the Fed it. chair. Y'all, I've been talking for the last thirty minutes. Lord Jesus seems to be slowing a bit, and services disinflation. I've been talking for the last twenty minutes, and therein lies the problem, right? Yeah, he's just not getting the help. Uh, I, I think it was interesting the I'm way sorry, he y'all. kind of uh, explained how his view has changed because of the data that we've been talking about almost every day from January. Not only did it come in hotter than expected, but it was those revisions. And Governor Waller gave us a bit of a curtain raiser on how that's affected Fed officials, basically saying, you know, the data's changed, so the outlook has changed, and that's why you get. <laughs> I didn't this know y'all been here. That if the data were, I've been talking the my way, little uh, off over here. Been, when the Fed goes to pencil just talking. In a new terminal rate, <laughs> just in talking March, and teaching and talking and talking uh, and talking. Than they previously put I forget in there. when and, I uh, take myself out, it takes the sound away. I just have to move that. my picture. I think picture. they were prepared for the idea that it could be higher. I'm learning. But what it wasn't prepared for is the idea of Y'all more rapid learning. pace, the idea they go back to 50s. And, and, and Scott, I just want to go through. I promise you, it's my best talking and teaching. Guys, but if you can put up. <laughs> the probability changes that we've seen. Oh, Lord, we got What's 30 more minutes is, together. Uh, you have, and I'm going to put my glasses on and look at this, Scott, a uh, 56% probability they go up to five. five so I just want y'all real quick, look over at QQQ and see what happens when it hits this 200-day moving average. Is it going, I'm always curious, is it going to get stuck? Is it going to shoot through? Is it going to bounce off of it and reject and go down? here at volume is not a lot of volume so it usually takes a lot of volume to shoot through that thing so we'll see what happens it could reject yeah look at that did you see how it got close but it didn't shoot through that 200 day moving average is a strong it's strong that's what the price has been over 200 days so i'm not surprised that it didn't shoot right through it and we're oversold and this isn't i don't know that i would call that the strongest trend i've seen so yeah y'all please forgive me i promise you when i say all you i was talking for the last 30 minutes Marilyn, it's got to be some way you and I can talk. It was two days later you got that mm. labor report for January. And then you had four weeks of January data that was just not good. It was not good. And it really did. You all look at that red candle. Uh, theory. Can't the get above. Is, I don't know. Can it give up, know get that above that 300? January is an aberrational blip. Let's Price bounced down. It's going that, down. October, November, December, you had good. Because uh, it's oversold it's already. Not it's not going to just be tearing to town. To yep, right Marilyn, you're going to have to. Because you know, I keep my phone here. Yep. <laughs> Oh, girl, help me stay straight, Marilyn. Help me. <laughs> help me stay straight. Lord, Lord, Lord. Nope, I was not on break. I was sitting here talking my little tuckers off. It's a very good one, okay? I understand we are looking at what this do you know the Fed is looking at this anyway we'll be we'll be together again on Thursday I get it but you have to Maryland that's the way we're gonna have to do it I'll have to keep my phone here if you get headline CPI which is what I'm talking about I don't know what to tell y'all except for welcome to the old lady club moderating the Fed is hell-bent for leather to crush jobs while CPI headline is moderating that's going to be a political problem for them Steve just real quick, I want to correct the idea that it was just the January data. Um, you know, Scott Wapner, the judge, is very good at calling people on the carpet. He's never called me on the carpet for my about face on this. And what happened, Jim, was that I was relying very much on the precipitous decline in the three-month inflation the rate. Debt that was pretty much re revised away. And that's really for what, what's going on. It's more than just January. <laughs> if it was one month. Jim, oh I'd be on board with you. And maybe it ends up going away again and we get better in, in March. But it was more than just January. I did an about face on thinking the Fed was was doing way too much. And now I'm thinking they had they're in the right place because of those revisions. So Kerry Firestone sitting here as, as well. What what do you make of what the Fed chair said today? 
uh, whether part of it was a surprise to the market or not, and how does it make you think about where we go from here? Well, it was definitely somewhat of a surprise pitch. when the market's down. The market didn't go up, and it moved down pretty sharply, although I, I see it's it coming back did. a little bit. Um, here's what I suspect he's addressing, and, I, and I'm concerned about it as well. We should all be. He referred to services several times in the testimony about how the service economy, it's more than half of the U.S., and it's very strong, and people are spending money on travel and on restaurants and, and experiences. Mm -hmm. and we I know promise that I will, debt is going up. We've got and 30 more I minutes together. If anybody if has any position, questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. But while we're waiting, to come pay attention to what these candlesticks do when they come near those moving averages. Did you all see this last one come in? And look, very low volume, because you can see that little tiny volume bar it doesn't, it cannot go past this moving average. It doesn't have enough momentum. It doesn't have enough steam. Look how tiny the candle is. It doesn't have enough to cut through it. So here's what I think is going to happen. This, this is about to go into some consolidation. We're between the 200 and the 9, the 13, and the 50 are underneath. Price is kind of trapped in between those two. And I heard somebody say this. These moving averages, they act like magnets. They, they want to come together. They're going to eventually come together. And whenever you see all four of those moving averages clustered together, you're probably going to see some consolidation. Just test it. Test it for yourself. When you see all of your moving averages coming, converging together, you're probably going to see some consolidation just like here. We've got the 9, the 13, and the 50 all together. Look at that. All there together. When they start to spread apart like this, they it's, you can't consolidate. That's, that's real price movement there. But pay attention. You'll see all these little patterns. And once you see those patterns, then you know that is not a time to enter a trade. It don't make sense. When these things are far apart and spread out like that, when this is ideal right here. One, two, three, four, you can clearly see something's going on. That's, that's, look at that. That's what's going on. They're still all far apart. That's what's going on. Once these things all converge together here, not a lot going on. And many times you can see lower volume there. This, a lot of buyers came into the market. That's what shot the price up. Got some volume here. And now these are getting tiny, tiny, tiny. I'm not sure that we talked about this, but this candle's a doji. Usually they're white or gray. And then you'll see this candle here. And really what that's saying is kind of like a tie. There were both buyers and sellers present, but there was no clear winner. Nobody took over. And so, yeah. You can also see this trend cooling. And in a little bit, we're probably going to see those dark blues come in here. If we could just master how to read this chart and that this chart, you don't need a degree to be able to look at candlesticks. You don't need a degree to understand bottom to top top to bottom you just don't look at this you see this crossover about to happen y'all pay attention to crossovers crossovers help us understand when a trend changes here's a crossover right here the only thing about the macd and people have said this i it's true it's a lagging indicator it's not very quick. It's indicating a crossover and a change here, but look, the move has already started. I think a quicker indicator is the TTM squeeze. The TTM squeeze tells us we're about to go into a trend change almost two candlesticks before the MACD indicates it. Because right here, when we go from red to yellow, oh, that is right here at this candle. But if I were waiting for this crossover on my MACD, I don't see it until two candles later. It, it shows me, but it's a lagging indicator. I like it because it is pretty visual. It's pretty accurate. It's just slow. So I 
um, I think C bar told us about the TTM squeeze because it is a quicker indicator. You get to see the trend change. And why do you need to know? Because the sooner you can get in to purchase your contract, the more profit you can make. So you do want a quick indicator. Like, do think the consumer is in better shape. And so I'm going to be paying attention this whole time, and I hope you do too, to, to what these candlesticks do you know, we, relative we to these the SMAs. SMAs. But also look at volume. What would get that thing through there is if a whole bunch of volume came in, a bunch of buyers or a bunch of sellers. If you saw a really big red bar down here, we could see some movement. But as long as there's no volume, some pretty big like not a lot of people present, you can't move it. So again, these all these are coming together. I would expect as they converge that we will see some consolidation. And that's what we see. Two, four, six, eight minutes. No price change. Just right here. Um, it's 1136. I would say by 12 o'clock, which makes sense in the middle of the day. They say traders on Wall Street and all the brokerage houses and all of, they're at lunch. Those are the market makers, you guys. We are not. Me sitting at home trading, all the people who are trading at home, we still don't make up enough to make big candles like this. This is not us. These are professional traders. These are brokerages. These are the big guys on Wall Street. They create these big candles, not us. Guess what we're doing? We're following them. They call that smart money. I don't know how smart it is, but they make the market. They make the trends. Those people control this stuff. They're buying all these millions of shares. We're just a, a small fraction. So we're trying to follow. That's why I follow the news. I want to know what's happening. Yes, those big candles are institutional traders. That is not us. We are following that. So if you think my little trade, my little two contracts or all our three little contracts together is impacting the market, no, it's not. We're just trying to cash in on what they're doing. That's the truth. I think when you look at it that way too, it doesn't matter. I've heard people say, oh, it's rigged. It could be as rigged as it wants to be. I'm with the people who rigging it. <laughs> I'm following them. If the people who are running the board are running to the left, guess what I'm going to do? Run to the left. If the people who are running the game say now it's time to turn red, guess what I'm doing? I'm following them. I am not trying to create this. I'm not trying to predict that what's going to happen. I don't care what's going to happen, to be honest with you, two days from now. I just care what, about what they're doing right now. And I want to watch. These candlesticks are my best indicator of what they're doing. I'm getting with the big boys. Doesn't that make sense? Why would we reinvent the wheel? Why are you out here trying to do it on your own? Mm -mm. I learned that a long time ago. Catch the wind. That's why birds fly in formation. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because why? Why would you fly singly? You got to beat all the wind. They fly in formation because it's easier for those people coming behind them. You don't see 20 birds scatter. They fly in formation. They have figured it out. Yes, Marilyn, we're just getting, and y'all, when I tell you, I don't care if we make $1,000 a day. Pennies, pennies, pennies on the dollar. Those people are making big, 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 big bucks. I don't care. I don't need big, 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 big bucks. I, I just don't. I, I, I could make it. My real brother is. I would be happy if I could if I could make three hundred dollars a day. You couldn't tell me anything. I would be tucking money away so fast, y'all. And that's my goal is to consistently make money each day. Now my days are like, I'm snatching, you know, I can make a hundred dollars. I might make $60 today. It's just kind of up and down. But as I get better, I, I think my goal is I want to be able to control how much money I make a day. I want to set a goal and say, I know no matter what, I can go in that market and find a setup 
that's going to pay me. And right now, I'm a little limited because I only trade one equity. I'm not there yet. When I can get up in the morning, look at that stuff and say, okay, I'm not going to trade QQQ today. I'm going to trade Tesla today because there's a good setup there. That's the ultimate. Because now you can shake this tree and make money with anything. But I'm way, I'm just getting my skills together, y'all. I know the things I need to work on. I need to still understand risk reward. Um, and that's just a matter of time. D helped me with some of that, with not purchasing contracts so far up the chain. She gave me a, a lot of insight that you can come down out of that options chain. You don't have to buy the most expensive um, contract to be safe and still make a profit. And you don't have to buy... 10 days, you can buy seven days, five days, but that's how you bring the contract price down. So I'm still working that sweet spot out for me. As I become more accurate, I don't need nine days. You know, the more accurate my entry, the more accurate my exit. So it's, it's, I'm telling you, it's just tweaking it. It's tweaking this thing so that you can make money. And I'm learning. I'm telling you all who Oliver Velez gave me some knowledge. He was like, you should set a loss. If you, you should never be losing more. He said between 66 and a hundred dollars a day. You just shouldn't. Once you, once you lose that amount of money, you should close your computer, <laughs> regroup, come back tomorrow. Mm -mm. That spoke volumes to me. Cause I'm, I'm a conservative trader. Um, D asked me the other day, did you blow your account? I almost chuckled. Me, girl, I'm never blowing my account because I don't risk money like that. To blow your account, you have to have all your money in the street and then something goes, it doesn't go your way, it goes wrong. Number one, I'm never going to do that. Never. I am, um, and I don't advise anybody do that. Don't, don't chase a trade. The way you blow your account is you get into a bad trade. Probably you're over leveraged. You've probably put a little too much money out there and you get scared and now you're trying to make up for that. And then you toss some more money out there. So many things wrong, emotionally wrong, strategy wrong. Nothing good can come of it. Now you got one bad trade and you're probably going to get into another bad trade behind that one trying to chase it. Nope. Let that stuff clear out. Here's my rule of thumb. I promise you, I just don't purchase more than three contracts. I just don't see any need to purchase for me at this point. To be honest with you, two is sufficient. And the reason I buy two, we talked about this earlier, is so that if I'm in a winning trade, I always want to take some profit. So I sell one as soon as I hit a percentage. And for me, that percentage is any, and I got to show y'all that one too. Yeah. With a smile. No way. I recall that. Not, nope, 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 no way. I just don't do it like that. I think guys do that. And people who allow their egos to get involved trying to, oh God, no, I couldn't sleep anytime. I, I know when I have too much money out in a trade because I'm, I'm uncomfortable. I'm okay with a $300 investment. That doesn't make me anxious. I can sleep at night. If it works out, great. If it don't work out, you know. Yeah, that dropping thousands of dollars. Mm -mm. But if you've got $10,000, $40,000, $50,000, then $1,000 might not be much to you. But... No, that's just too risky. That doesn't make sense. That's that's gambling. If it's not gambling, that's just ego. That's your ego. You've gotten your ego involved and you're trying to win at all costs. Mm -mm. I'm more learning, to be honest with you. These, you know, two contracts at best, three if I really feel strongly. And when I reach my profit target, and this is where I went wrong yesterday, you guys, because I bought three and those calls, it was so beautiful. The calls went up and instead of selling two and keeping one, just in case it continued to go up, I only sold one. I got all the profit. It was a good profit, but I left two. I should have done it the other way around. So you always want to capture as much of the profit as you can. And then leave one, 
you know, one runner. I would take out the bulk of the money. I did the reverse yesterday. Lesson learned. Sell the two, leave one, and then make sure that you don't let that one get too low and get into your profits. So those are the kinds of things that I'm learning. Real practical things, how to manage your money, how to manage your risk. I see no need for 10 contracts at this point. I see no need for a beginning trader to be out here with, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. We, I don't have the skill level to risk that kind of capital. And it's just, I'm not in it for that. I'm not trying to get rich quick. That's what that is. That's like people who are trying to do the get rich quick thing. I got a stock tip. I'm about 10 contracts. Nope. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Not going to do it. Not going to do it. Not going to do it. So I think you'll be happier, less stressed if your investment size fits your, is appropriate for your account. You know, if you got a thousand dollar account, you don't want to take a $700 trade. That's 70% of your account. What if something goes wrong? Too much risk. If you got a thousand dollar account, a hundred dollar trade, you know, a $50 trade. That way you live to fight another day. You may not be making huge gains, but that's okay. You'll make huge gains later. Don't worry. You'll get there. Let's learn how to make small gains. This to me is the most scalable business anybody could be in because once you learn how to make $50, if you can make $50 every day, the only difference between making $50 and making $500 is buying more contracts. But you don't do that. You don't scale up on a tip and you don't have the skills. No, that's, that's gambling. That's dumb. So we want to be smart. Um, you want to, you know, don't, 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 don't risk it. Don't, don't do it. It's not worth it. It's not worth it on that. I hope this could be, I could make $2,000. No, we got lucky in those day trades and I'll go back over before we go. Cause we got about 15 more minutes. So I'm going to log out of my account and go back over to the paper trade and just show you how, cause we probably lost some money. Now we're down two ninety nine, three. We're down maybe $2, but they, if I had cashed those out this morning, they were still very profitable trades. So hold on. And this will be the last thing that we do today. I'm going to go ahead and pull those paper trades. I'm going to sell them today because I think they only have a day or so left on them. And we, I was hoping living my dream came in here because I was going to ask him to help us evaluate those trades. Like, was there anything we could have done differently? You know, from did we risk too much? You know, what would he have done differently? So let me go ahead and pull them up. I think if you were here Thursday, then you saw us buy these contracts. And I'm telling you, I think what went right, was the entry. That RSI was like right in the middle. It was like around 40 something and the thing shot up. It was a good, I know he was earlier and I should have asked him, but what I can do is because I got the call number for the trade, I can still shoot that to him and ask him to evaluate that trade for us. Like what would he have done differently? And what I think he'd probably say is risk to reward because I paid, I, I went up the options chain. I paid for those. We could have made just as much money or we could have still made money and paid a little less. I think that would be the one thing I'd tweak. But the entry was excellent. Y'all, the entry was, the entry, I, that was good. I've been working on entries. And I'll, I'll see if I can show it to you. Like where we got in on that trade that day. So the entry was good. We picked good contracts. I think I just could have maybe gotten them cheaper. 
and not risked as much, but we came out on top. So it's pulling up now. I'm gonna go over here to Market Watch, our home screen. Yeah, we're down to $4,700. Those two trades were up to $5,200. So let me pull you back in and show you. Let's see what we did. And when I tell you those were totally anybody in here who was listening that day could have placed that trade. Anybody could have. So you can see this is where they are now. And let's look at the chart. I'll start there. It's QQQ. We bought them on Thursday. So that we Thursday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday. We bought them here on this day. And let's see if I can. Yes. Do you all see where this RSI is? You see, that's a value of 47. This was so I, I can't I, I don't even I can't believe we even did this. But we purchased them somewhere around here because it was early in the day. Yep. It was around 11. And we got in right here. And then the RSI shot up and they stayed up and kept going up and kept going up. And we caught all of this, y'all. We got all of this up. You see how this RSI, we got all of that. That's how we got in. That's how we made the money. The money was made on a good entry. So let me show you where we are. So here we go. Hopefully you guys can see it. Yep. So here are the calls. I'm going to click here and it'll show you the trade. We purchased it. Yep. At 1122 on March the 2nd, we bought three, nothing crazy. I mean, it wasn't 10, it was three contracts. Um, here's where I think we could have, I could have made a better choice or I could have tried to get a better price because each one of those contracts was $795. That's a little pricey. I could have maybe paid less. We wouldn't have made as much money, but it was still a good profit. So here's, can you guys see this? We profited 102% on those three. Um, so today you can see what we lost today with that thing with Powell. This one lost $300 today and this one lost about $300. So had I sold them before Powell spoke, we would have captured all of that in terms of profit. These are trades anybody could have taken. Anybody who was sitting here with us could have said, well, let me go on over and purchase this. It was nothing special. It wasn't any, we didn't invest $10,000. It wasn't that. These were even cheaper. We bought three calls at two, the 285 strike. We bought three with our paper money. We paid $650 and we netted, that was times three, so about $1,800. We made on that investment, to be honest with you, it was about at the top, it was about $2,600. But again, you can see the percentage here. We Let me make sure you guys can see it and you're with me. Um, we made a profit of 114%. I could have took that trade. I could have said, excuse me, y'all, hold on. We're going to buy them in the paper money. Let me go on over here and purchase these two. But y'all know I can't do both at the same time. Y'all see that. I cannot teach and trade. I just don't, I just, it doesn't work. I have decided this is the way that works for me. I like to take Tuesday to talk with us. That's all we're doing is talking and working in this paper account. On Thursday, that's all I want to do. I don't like having to toggle back and forth between real money and paper money. If I'm trading Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'm fully present. That's how I like to trade. I have to because it takes all of me. I have to be fully present. I can't be talking and doing all that stuff. I lost so much money doing that. Or I made dumb decisions doing that. It doesn't work. So you guys can see, so here's what I'll do. I'm going to go ahead and cash these out because they will expire tomorrow. And I'm not sure we're going to see much more upside with after Powell's talk today. Who knows? So I'm going to go ahead and cash this out. 
And you can see, I'm just gonna make a closing order. This is so great. We bought them at whatever it was, $7.95, and they went up to $15.70. That's how you can see, you know, we did it. Anybody can do it. Anybody who was sitting here with me could have been like, hold tight. I'm going to mimic what you're doing. I'm going to buy that thing. You'd have had, that's your money. So we just sold that one. It's working. And then I'm going to go in and get the other one and sell it too. Because we can capitalize. Yep, sold. And now we're going to take this $2,100 off the table too. And I'll show you, it goes into our account. So that's, we were up over $200,000. So we just added another $5,000 to our paper account. I'm going to sell that one too. And... Maybe this is something that we can talk about. I want to talk about pricing. So I'm going to have, I'm going to ask Live in My Dream or Johnny or somebody to come in and talk to us about how to properly price, you know, to buy at the best price. Okay, so let me go here and then we can look at where our the account is now, how much money. Are we, where are we? Here it is. Okay, so we're at 230. This account started at $200,000. That's what they always set. You know, when you reset your money, you get $200,000. And so in our paper account, we have accumulated $35,000. That's so crazy to me. That's so crazy. That's crazy. But you saw we just banked another five grand. I don't know, y'all. Sooner or later, this stuff is, we're going to have to just go on in. Somebody's going to have to bite the bullet and start purchasing some of these contracts. So I will keep you guys posted on, so maybe on Thursday, we'll purchase some more contracts too. Um, on Thursday, if you guys have something in mind, like if you're watching something, please let me know, drop it in the chat and we can purchase that in our paper account. We can discuss all, we can do one for long-term, short-term. We can do where we paid a lot of money, a little bit of money and just watch. That way you can see if I buy the same, you know, on the same day, maybe we have a Delta of 84 Let's use a delta of 50. Same contract, same day, same amount of time. And let's just see which one makes the most money. Um, we, can, we can experiment with all of that stuff. Maybe we buy one that expires today. Then we buy one that expires a week from now. How does that affect the money? So I know somebody was watching. Otara was watching Ford. Somebody wanted Apple. Tesla's always a good one to, to work with, too. Tesla's got lots of movement. So if you are interested in a particular company, just drop it down here in the chat on Thursday. We'll purchase those contracts. And let's see if we can get some more money in our paper account. Because I'm telling you, by the time you can be consistent in your paper account, then you can roll over to your real money account. So that's it for today. So right now we have nothing purchased. Let me go back and make sure. This is our paper account. We don't have any contracts. We're all, we're all sold. Everything has been purchased. Everything. You can even see we lost a little money. We lost $900 today and we still cashed out $5,000. That's crazy. That's so crazy to me. But we mitigated our losses today by getting rid of those puts. And then these two, I was over there in the real money account. I should have sold these before because we didn't have to lose any of that money today. But it's paper. But we, we want to maximize the, the wins. So, all right, folks, I will see you guys on Thursday. Again, think about any stocks you want to practice with. You can practice in your paper account. 
and I will practice in my paper account for you all to see what's going on. Yep, check out the community tab. If you um, want access to the Google Drive and those resources, please email me at fromlacktolegacy at gmail.com. I will send you an invitation so that you can just go into that. You can watch the videos, um, any of the past Zooms, all of that stuff is there for you. If you want help with setting up Thinkorswim, please just, there's a link in any of the videos, or you can go to my webpage from Lactolegacy at gmail.com or from Lactolegacy.com. Yeah, is it? Yes. Yeah, from Lactolegacy.com. Any of those, and you can schedule a time, and I'll just go over it with you one on one. But for today, we are done. We made a little money today, and I will talk to you guys soon. Thanks, guys. See you guys on Thursday. Check out the community tab. Marilyn, thank you. You are my earth angel. Couldn't do it without you. All right. We'll talk soon. Bye, folks.